Welcome, welcome. We're gonna go ahead and get started right now. You can please have a seat. Welcome to this, uh, to this uh, special event. My name is Derek Anderson. I'm from the Office of the President and the School of Public Affairs here at Arizona State University. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started and turn the time over to, as you can see on the agenda, to Dean Jonathan Capel from ASU and Terry Gerton from the National Academy of Public Administration. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. That was a little feeble. Good morning. All right, that's better, thank you. Uh, I'm, ap I'm absolutely delighted to welcome you to ASU for this, uh, interesting, this interesting conversation that we've got set for today. Uh, I have to fully acknowledge uh, Terry Gerton, who we'll welcome in a moment, but this, is a, this is, comes from her uh, and her team, the idea for this event, and not only the idea substantively, but the idea that it would be best as a collaboration between the National Academy of Public Administration and Arizona State University, and I think it's worked out really well and has achieved what she envisioned by bringing it together with the university. That is, what we've brought together is a collection not just of academics and not just of practitioners, but a really kind of compelling mix of the two uh, with the goal of getting some traction on it. And, and I will say I'm, I take some particular delight in working with the National Academy as a fellow of the National Academy of Public Administration. I want to acknowledge Karen Mossberger, who's sitting right behind, also a fellow. And where'd Stu Bretscheider go? Stu, also a fellow. And uh, Michael Crow, who's president of ASU, also a fellow of the National Academy. We're very excited to be partnering with this organization, which represents a very important a very important thread of American democracy, right? Which is that you have to have competent, well-run public institutions to manage our to manage our country, and the infrastructure is part of it. I'm going to take the I'm going to take the liberty to give a little bit of a thought on the subject of our conference today, since uh, since I have a microphone and nobody can take it away from me. Um, so I was thinking about the topic of I was thinking about the topic of the infrastructure. And I realize that it's a funny topic because we talk about the national infrastructure, but as, as is evident from the program today, we don't have one infrastructure. We have myriad infrastructures, whether you're talking about energy, transportation, telecommunications, transport. All of these infrastructures are independently important, and the challenge of maintaining them, upgrading them, is made much more complex by the fact that you have so many. And, uh, and my funny way of sort of thinking about that is one of the perpetual problems that we all know, once a street gets newly paved in your neighborhood, it is a law of nature that the next day, some utility will come and dig it up. Um, and I've talked to many city managers about the challenge of trying to anticipate that and get all the work done on the street before, right, so that you do the you do the pipes and you do the sewer and you do everything before and they've, I've talked to many and they've said that's actually much more complicated than you would ever believe because of all the different systems involved and all the different players involved. And so I hope what we get into today is the complexity not only of the multiple systems but of the multiple layers of governance that are involved. We have obviously local, county, state and federal players and that's only the governmental side. Uh, we have all kinds of non-governmental entities, including the private sector, who performs a good portion of the work on our infrastructure and maintains it and operates it, but also non-governmental organizations like the professional associations that are so well represented at our conference today. Final thought, and it's one that I don't think most people would naturally come to, is that I believe universities can play a role in addressing this topic. And that, I think, was the insight that uh, Terry and her Napa colleagues had in reaching out and having a university sitting at the table for this. Universities can be vital players in doing a better job in maintaining and upgrading our infrastructure. First of all, because universities are ultimately the places that are where the people doing this work are going to be prepared. And so we have to be aware of what the challenges are and our faculty have to be thinking through these things as we design curriculum and so on. And that doesn't fall within the domain of any one school. One of the most exciting things about this project is that it's brought together people at our own university who hadn't been talking to each other particularly regularly, and now we've got this working group 
made up of people from the School of Public Affairs, which is my academic home, uh, the School of Geographical Studies and Urban Planning, and the School of Sustainable Engineering and the Built Environment. All of us should be talking to each other on a regular basis, wrestling with these issues, but academia being what academia is, we tend to gravitate into our own pools. This is gonna be a way that we not only have forged relationships, but will continue to work together. But secondly, universities can and should be the home, obviously, of research and the search for solutions in particular. And here we have an opportunity to draw inspiration from this conference and figure out how we can be proactive in finding answers to the challenges that are before us. Obviously, one elemental challenge that's the core topic of this conversation is just mapping the infrastructure and figuring out what the needs are and where they, uh, where the vulnerabilities lie, and I'll leave it to you to all figure out what needs to be mapped. I'm not the right answer for that. But we hope that, in some sense, this conference creates marching orders for us, and not only for us, Arizona State University, but for us, the Academy, to be a, a productive and contributing partner to this great challenge. So thank you so much to, for all of you for making your way here. Uh, you're nipping in just before it gets really hot, so I hope you enjoy the Arizona weather. And I want to say a special hello to our group in DC. We can't see you. I thought we would see them. But hopefully you can see us. Do we know that they're there, or am I speaking to no one? Oh, there they are. That looks really weird. <laughs> but we, to, a special hello to the group that's gathered at our brand new Washington DC Center. Uh, I think this might be our inaugural, our inaugural, there, there they are, uh, our inaugural attempt at creating one event that brings together a group in uh, Arizona and at the ASU Center, which is conveniently located at 18th and I, for those of you who are in uh, Washington. Uh, we hope this becomes a regular feature where we are able to use this facility to bring together folks in Washington, in Arizona, and quite frankly, globally. Um, so we hope, that, uh, we hope that you are participating today and don't feel shy about doing whatever it is. They, do they have like flags so they can semaphore when they want to speak? Hopefully, hopefully we'll figure that out. You all have your flags, right? <laughs> I don't know. They can't hear me. Anyway, welcome to everybody. I look forward to an interesting uh, and productive conversation. I think that, I think that we, will, uh, we will have a lot of uh, direction that will come out of this meeting and look forward to seeing where we end up. And without further ado, I want to hand the microphone to Terry Girton, who will offer a welcome from the National Academy of Public Administration. Well, good morning. I won't make you recite. Um, I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, this is a wonderful opportunity, as Jonathan has said, to bring together a group that doesn't normally get together to talk about something that's really important. Um, but before I jump into that, and he's introduced some of our fellows, for those of you who aren't familiar with the National Academy of Public Administration, I want to do just a quick introduction. We are a, a congressionally chartered, nonpartisan, nonprofit organization. We're in our 51st year. Um, and our charter specifically charges us with working with government agencies at all levels to make government work better, looking at the administration and the processes of governance and trying to solve those things that make it hard to do business. Um, the way we do that is through our fellows. And so you've got some of them here. We have nearly 900 of them who are nominated and elected into membership based on uh, outstanding careers in public administration, whether that's from the academic perspective, the federal perspective, or the state and local perspective. So we have an incredible depth of knowledge across a, um, all the different topics of multiple levels of government, but also a breadth of exposure as we're all across the country. And so we have the ability um, to reach out across that network and bring folks together to have really interesting conversations. And that's why we're here today. But I thought it might be helpful to give you a little bit of background on how we got here. Um, so last year, the Academy began a series of conversations we called Governing Across the Divide. Following our last presidential election, it seemed to us that government was really beset on all sides by real divisions that would make it very difficult to actually govern. Um, and so we decided to get outside of Washington, D.C. to talk to people 
who seem to be pushing the envelope of successful governance in different areas. We first went to Sacramento with the USC Price School to look at innovations in state government. Um, specifically, they're looking at environmental policy and healthcare policy. Then we went to Austin with the LBJ School and we looked at innovation in city government, um, which was fascinating. If you want to know about innovation, you go to Austin, right? Uh, and then we looked at citizenship and the future of public service with the Maxwell School at Syracuse University. And we wrapped all that up with a session on the critical infrastructure lifelines at George Mason University in Virginia and their School of Critical Infrastructure Protection. So what we tried to do was pull together this idea of different levels of government and different levels of innovation. So today's event, generously hosted by ASU and their incredible team here, kicks off our 2018 series, Governing Across the Divide, Part 2. Um, what we hope to do this year is to pull threads from our 2017 conversations and go beyond the solution description to solution development. Uh, so there's been a lot of discussion and a lot of anticipation about a national infrastructure plan from the Trump administration. But one of the issues that we identified in our conversations last year was the necessity for communities and regions to collaborate across boundaries to prioritize opportunities and to generate funding options that could make infrastructure investment real. And yet the proposal from the administration suggested that federal funds would be provided via formula grants to states to support state priorities. So state infrastructure needs absolutely must be addressed, but infrastructure offers us a classic economic case of the commons. There's a lack of interest in, and really lack of information about, and opportunity for investing in cross-boundary assets that form the critical nodes of so many of our infrastructure networks. So we think that we need a national infrastructure investment strategy that allows us to prioritize investments that support the nation's need for functioning transportation, power, water, and communication infrastructure, infrastructure networks if we expect to be able to support economic growth. So it's a widely uh, accepted premise that the general connection, uh, condition of America's infrastructure is poor, and we're going to hear about that uh, from our first speaker, and that we need major investments in the trillions of dollars. Um, but you might ask, how do we prioritize those, and how do we get agreement on the prioritization of that infrastructure? So that's why the Academy is actually promoting um, discussion of infrastructure investment. It's not just the purview of engineers and logisticians. We think, at its root, it's a question of good public administration. Priority setting is an inherently political process, and it requires the recognition of mutual interests in deal making, but it can't function well in the absence of good information. Priority setting in infrastructure is hindered by a lack of systematic information available on the nation's inv inventory of infrastructure assets, their locations, and their conditions. So all politics is local, and infrastructure is very local, and yet we don't really have granular information on the location and condition of infrastructure across the nation in a way that can enable positive outcome politics. Geographic information systems for capturing location-based data on infrastructure have been broadly adopted by public agencies and private organizations. But access to that information is constrained by a variety of factors, including the lack of interoperability across systems, jurisdictional issues, and proprietary rights. And moreover, the data is collected for different reasons, using different standards, and so therefore we often can't compare it and connect it. So the information on the nation's infrastructure is uneven, it's stovepiped, and it's not integrated. We think that if we can address some of these challenges, we can communicate the information to decision makers in a way that helps build constituencies and helps build agreement. So in an age increasingly defined by internet-based systems and open data, the challenge is really not one of technology, it's a public leadership challenge. It's marshalling support across key stakeholders around a positive vision, a national infrastructure map that could provide political leaders and citizens 
with readily available, systematic, comparable location-based information that can then inform a political process for determining priorities and acting on them. However, like all public visions, success depends on competent, dedicated public administration capacity to effectively execute it. So today, to begin the process of, ad of addressing these challenges, we're partnering with ASU, the National Academy of Construction, and the American Geographical Society to convene you all, leaders in public administration, infrastructure development, geospatial technology, and data integration. We're looking at industry, government, universities, and the social sector to tackle this very basic question. To have hope of a national infrastructure strategy, we have to have a common understanding, a common picture of our national infrastructure. We want to learn from those who've tested and built similar processes at the local level to explore the obstacles that they overcame in the process and enable our government system to innovatively develop these kinds of solutions at the national level. So as we get ready to kick off the most important part of the agenda, I want to thank a few people for making today's event possible. My deepest thanks to President Mike Crow, Dean Jonathan Capel, Derek Anderson, and the staff here at ASU who have put on a terrific event already. Wayne Crew, who's the Executive Director of the National Academy of Construction, Dr. Chris Tucker from the American Geographical Society, who were instrumental in pulling so many of our speakers uh, together, and from the National Academy of Public Administration in our DC space today, Dr. John Tucker, who not only conceived of today's conversation, but really oversaw so much of the coordination necessary to make it happen. As Dean Capellas said, today's event is really intended to be the first step of a new process to lay the foundations for creating a national infrastructure map. We must find a way to govern across many divides to deliver a national infrastructure that can sustain and support our nation's economic development through the 21st century. We are glad you all are here, but today's event is not one and done. Right? We really are counting on you to be active participants in the discussion and then to continue the work um, and the progress once we leave here today. So again, my thanks for being here, for joining us in this conversation both here and in DC. I'll be followed by Ed Gibson, who's going to introduce our keynote speaker. Thank you. Good morning. Um, thanks, Terry. Um, I'm excited to be here. This is a really neat conference, and we'll talk a little bit about my background first. But just a thought for the day. Um, I was looking, I'm, I'm a director of a school here with about 1,700 civil engineers, construction managers, construction engineers, and environmental engineers. And we were looking at our incoming freshman class next fall, OK? So fall of 2018. And, and I realized that part of that freshman class will have been born in this century. And next year, almost all of that freshman class in 2019 will have been born in this century. Um, there are not many people in this room that can say that. Um, and the reality of it is they've been immersed in digital technology since the day they were born in many cases. So they're going to be the ones who are going to be leading the charge in this in the future. So I think it's important for us to be here together to talk about this. Again, my role is the director of a school. Um, I really, a big part of our focus is on infrastructure. It's an extremely important uh, topic that we're going into today. Uh, the importance of both macro and micro geospatial information. Um, it certainly plays a big role in programmatic decision making, but also project decision making. Um, our ability to predict what, what is going to happen in capital projects. Our ability to take engineering design and construction decisions to a level that will allow us to be more efficient and sustainable and resilient. So I think it's a great topic that we have today. Um, I'm, it's my pleasure to introduce our kickoff speaker this morning, Greg DiLoretto. Um, Greg retired in 2013 at, after 14 years as CEO of Tualatin Water, Valley Water District, which is located in metropolitan Portland. Um, he's served on the, as a director on the American Society of Civil Engineers Board of Direction 
from 2004 to 2006, and then he served as president of ASCE in 2013. He's received a number of awards. They're in the bio from ASCE. Um, one of the things he, he has is he has a background or degrees in both engineering, civil engineering, and also public policy. So he kind of talks across both aisles here today. Um, he was inducted as Oregon State University's Academy, into Oregon State University's Academy of Distinguished Engineers a few years ago. Uh, more important for what we're talking about today, um, Greg currently serves on ASC's Committee on America's Infrastructure, which is responsible for the well-known infrastructure report card, which he's going to talk about this morning. So I guess he's Mr. Report Card. Um, and he's also a chair of the Board of an Institute for Sustainable Infrastructure. Um, he's a registered civil and environmental engineer in Oregon, in Oregon as well as a land surveyor. So please help me in welcoming Greg. Thanks, Ed, and it's, it's great for the opportunity to be here this morning to talk to you and kick off your summit on infrastructure. You know, it's an issue that increasingly dominates the news across the country and has serious consequences for the nation's economy, not to mention our quality of life. Um, and what's interesting is that it, it is increasingly in the news and we're increasingly talking about it. In fact. Each Tuesday for the next three weeks, I'm going around the country talking about this very topic. Next week, I'll be in St. Louis talking to the Government Finance Officers Association about infrastructure. And the week after, I'm in another group in San Diego, a public utility commissioner group, talking about infrastructure and our need to invest in it. As mentioned, I'm chair of the ASC's Committee on America's Infrastructure, and my undergraduate degree is in civil engineering and my master's degree is in public administration. So the two degrees that frankly are pretty important if you're going to be doing infrastructure and I served 17 years as a public works director and a city engineer for cities of increasingly larger size and as mentioned the last 14 years as the chief executive of a publicly owned water, large water utility in the Portland, Oregon area. As the nation's oldest engineering society, ASCE represents 150,000 civil engineers who serve as one of the stewards of infrastructure here, both here in the United States and around the globe. And we serve as a leading advocate for sustainable infrastructure. Yeah, perfect. So why have the brightest minds gathered here today to talk about infrastructure? Well, we have some good news. As I mentioned, America's awareness of infrastructure and its importance to our quality of life and economy is rising along with a greater understanding about the increasingly concerning state of our nation's infrastructure. We released our first report card in 1998. It was on an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper. It was about two pages long. This was it. And it got almost no attention at all. Today we have over, in the last 12 months, we have over 300,000 users that are using our report card. After the president released his infrastructure plan, we did a media tour. We reached over 12 and a half million people. We've been on the John Stewart Show. We've been on Stephen Colbert. That report card and the nation's importance of infrastructure is reaching America. And in fact, in a public opinion, opinion poll, shows that a significant number of Americans, 87%, in one recent poll, agree that the federal government should increase its investment in infrastructure. Yet while some investment uh, and progress has been made, particularly at the state and local level, it's not enough to prepare our nation for a 21st century economy relying on 20th century infrastructure and 20th century funding. Meanwhile, other nations have committed to infrastructure investments that will attract the businesses, innovations, and jobs of tomorrow, jeopardizing America's economic leadership in the global economy. China spends more on infrastructure annually than North America and Western Europe combined. And Japan is projected to spend 1.5% more of their gross domestic product on infrastructure over the next 15 years to avoid a substantial growth so slowdown. Now, as you're about to see 
in the report card grades, America's infrastructure challenges are significant, and they are cause for concern. Now, as I mentioned, every four years since 1998, ASC has prepared a comprehensive assessment of the nation's 16 major categories of, of infrastructure and its report card. And in your um, folder here, you have a, co a paper copy of the, uh, of the report card that we use. In 2017's infrastructure report card, America's cumulative GPA was once again a D plus. Yay. The cumulative grade reflects the significant backlog of needs facing our nation's infrastructure, particularly in three categories that experienced a decline in grades, solid waste, parks, and especially transit. The report card's lowest grade at a D minus. A good friend and colleague of mine is the Secretary of DOT for one of our more popular st populous states, and he has told me that certainly in the and the urban areas, the only way he sees out of transportation problems is through transit. And yet, it is nearly failing in this country as an industry. Please keep in mind, there are probably some out there that are doing A work, but what we look at in our report card is looking at these categories as an industry, overall nationwide. Now, six category re grades remained unchanged from 2013. Aviation, bridges, dams, drinking water, energy, and roads. And with all but bridges stalled with a grade of D. There were some signs of progress. Seven categories saw slight improvements. Hazardous waste, inland waterways, levees, ports, rails, schools, and wastewater. Here's the key. Where we see areas of infrastructure that improved, those categories benefited from strong leadership from both elected and appointed officials. I have to say that I sometimes blamed my peers appointed officials for failing to put together the communication tools necessary for their elected officials to be able to make those hard decisions on infrastructure. Also thoughtful policy making. That's an area of expertise for many of our audience members. And finally, investments that garnered results. Now the grades in these 16 categories reflect the fact that America's infrastructure bill is overdue. And I need to point out, I think it was mentioned earlier, while we have 16 categories of infrastructure, understand that they all work together. And it doesn't really work for you to concentrate on one of those Put all your efforts there and expect our infrastructure issues to be solved. I use an example of wastewater treatment. We could have best wastewater treatment in this country, but if we fail to invest in the electrical grid system, we have a problem because wastewater treatment plants are some of the largest users of electricity. The same with roads. We could have a perfect road system, but getting our goods out of this country won't work if our ports and our inland waterways do not work as well. It is connected. Now, in addition to grading the nation's infrastructure every four years, ASCE also estimates the investment needed in each infrastructure category to maintain a state of good repair and earn a grade of B, which is what we believe our infrastructure needs to, the condition it needs to be in for economic prosperity and quality of life. The most recent analysis reveals, as you can see, that the U.S. has only been paying about half of its infrastructure bill for some time. And failing to close that gap ri risks rising costs, falling business productivity, plummeting gross domestic product, lost jobs, and ultimately reduced disposable income for every American family. Between 2016 and 2025, the estimated investment gap totals just over $2 trillion. And even though Congress and some states and local agencies have recently made efforts to invest more in infrastructure, unfortunately those efforts do not come close to what is needed. We've simply failed to invest for too long and now we're struggling to catch up. So failing to close the infrastructure gap brings some serious economic consequences. According to ASCE's latest economic study, Failure to Act, if we do not address our infrastructure gap, we can stand to see a loss 
of $3.5 trillion in the U.S. gross domestic product by 2025. That is equal to the current GDP of Germany today. We stand to see businesses losing about $7 trillion by 2025. And finally, 2.5 million potentially high-paying jobs will be lost in 2025 because we're simply no longer economically competitive. But here's the number, because those are so big, most people can't get their heads around them. Here's the number. On top of that, each American family is already losing $3,400 in lost disposable income each year, more than $9 per day due to poor infrastructure. That's income we could be saving or spending on other things that make our lives better. But instead, we're spending it on car repairs because our roads are falling apart or wasted time and gas. Do you realize, on average, Americans waste 40 hours a year stuck in traffic, unless you live in LA, and then it's about 80? That means you basically gave up one week vacation to sit on the Interstate 405 in Los Angeles. I did an interview last week with Vice News, and, uh, and this interview was predicated upon a story out of, of Louisiana, where uh, a couple of small cities have failed to invest in their water system. Now, part of that was due to corruption but they failed to invest in their water system. And the lady points out, and she's economically challenged, that I am spending $20 a week on bottled water because I can't use the city's water system. Those are the kind of things that go into that lost $3,400. But here's the deal. For $4 a day, the cup of a nice, you know, the price of a nice latte, and that's per family, we could solve this. We're already spent losing $9 a day. We could solve it for four over that next 10-year period. So what do we do about the poor state of our nation's infrastructure and this widening uh, investment gap? Well, one of the reasons you're here today is to talk about solving the problem, which is the beauty of, of what I get to do by going around giving these talks is to hopefully paint, unfortunately, a grim picture, but also to help spark the conversation about how we're going to solve this problem. And let's, I want to talk to you about at least what ASCE sees as the solutions uh, that needed to be interacted. We urge the following points. We can do a lot of structural things, but the fact of the matter is the first thing we have to do is investment. If the United States is serious about achieving an infrastructure system fit for the 21st century, some specific steps must be taken, beginning with long-term, increased, consistent investment. Delaying investment escalates costs and risks of an aging infrastructure, something our nation can no longer afford to do. And you all know this. I've been working with a public agency, kind of helping them a little bit. They're small. They did a master plan, a water master plan, 20 years ago. It said, you need to do these projects, and it's going to cost you $14 million. They updated the master plan 10 years later. You've got to do the same projects, which you haven't done, and the price went up. They just finished up that updating that master plan this year. The same projects they haven't done, and it is now $44 million. This is for an agency that serves 5,000 people. That's how many people they serve. $44 million. They didn't raise their rates for 20 years. They finally bit the dust and doubled them. Of course, they have unhappy customers now. To close that $2 trillion 10-year investment gap, meet future need, and restore our global competitive advantage, we have to inve increase investment from all levels of government and the private sector from 2.5% of our gross domestic product to 3.5% by 2025. And here's the other key. Infrastructure owners and operators must charge, and Americans must be willing to pay the rates and fees that reflect the true cost of using maintaining and improving all our infrastructure. And the fact of the matter is, infrastructure is a, pay, is a system we pay for. There's no somebody else that pays for it. We pay as the users of that system, and we have to be willing to pay that. And we have to provide those tools for our elected officials to be willing to enact those fees and charges to uh, make those rates. And I can tell you on a side, if someone's talk about it, I was successful doing that for 30 years. Revenues were increased. We had no unfunded liability. The second area, then, is in leadership and planning. Smart investment will only be possible with leadership planning, and I, we already heard about it, a clear vision for our nation's infrastructure. 
Leaders from all levels of government, business, labor, nonprofit organizations, academia, we all have to come together to ensure all investments are spent wisely. We've heard prioritize our projects with critical benefits to the economy, public safety, and quality of life while also planning for the costs of building, not only building, which we all think about, but operating and maintaining the infrastructure for its entire life. You will spend more operating and maintaining the infrastructure than you did actually building it. As you talk today, that might mean getting better quality data and standardizing processes for many of our infrastructure categories. In some cases, like roads and bridges, we have some widely accepted standards. For example, pavement condition rating systems that we use, and also bridge sufficiency ratings that we use. But the problem is, as was mentioned, the number of agencies and jurisdictions responsible for infrastructure improvements. Just for example, I was in the water business, there's some 53,000 water providers in this country. Now, some of them, there's a, a lot of 80% of it can be served by probably 1,500 of them that are doing it, but it doesn't matter, there's 53,000 of them. Unfortunately, the trend for the federal government seems to be backing away. When we built the interstate highway system, we as a nation, the federal government is us, let's remember, we as a nation paid 90% of the interstate system and the locals put up 10%. We've actually inverted that and today the locals pay almost 90 and the feds pay 10%. The federal government's also backing away unfortunately from collecting the data which we use in preparing the report card. And with such a little investment at the federal level it makes it harder for local and state governments to cooperate towards a national vision. Unfortunately, what that could tend to mean for us in infrastructure particularly is we're liable to wind up with a have and have not system of states. And that's unfortunate where you're connecting roads or drinking water or wastewater where they all cross boundaries. If you think about it, I like to believe we had a national vision with the interstate highway system. We had a national vision with the Clean Water Act. We had a national vision with the Safe Drinking Water Act. But that was more than 40 years ago. The role for standard setting now falls outside federal regulation, typically is done by professional organizations like the Institute uh, for Transporta our Transportation Engineers or my own organization or the American Water Works Association and so forth. Ne nevertheless, ASCE specifically advocates the following steps. We're bold enough to say that any project that receives over $5 million in federal funding should use life cycle cost analysis and develop a plan for funding the project, including its operation and maintenance until the end of its service life. Create incentives for state and local governments in the private sector to invest in maintenance. Develop tools to ensure that projects most in need investment and maintenance are prioritized to leverage limited funding wisely. And we have to streamline the permitting process across infrastructure sectors with safeguards to protect the natural environment, but to provide greater clarity to, of the regulatory requirements and bring priority projects to reality more quickly and secure cost savings. And we have to identify a pipeline of infrastructure projects to attract to the private sector investment and public-private partnerships. And we must finally prepare for the future. We must utilize new approaches, materials, and technologies to ensure our infrastructure is more resilient and sustainable. We believe that can be achieved by developing active community resilient programs for severe weather and seismic events to establish communication systems and recovery plans to reduce impacts on the local economy, the quality of life, and the environment. We need to consider emerging technologies and shifting social and economic trends such as autonomous vehicles, distributed power generation and storage, and larger ships when building new infrastructure to assure long-term utility. We got to improve land use planning at the local level to consider the function of existing and new infrastructure. Now I come from kind of the mecca of land use planning in Portland, Oregon. We're the only city with a with an urban growth boundary that talks about where you can grow and where you can't and how we can do infrastructure. But we have to consider that function of existing and new infrastructure and the balance between the built and the natural environment 
and population trends in communities of all sizes and into the future. And we've got to support research and development into innovative new materials and technologies and processes to modernize and extend the life of infrastructure, expedite repairs or replacement, and promote cost savings. Strengthening how data is collected and used is another area ripe for improvement. As was mentioned, I just finished the year as the chair of the Institute for Sustainable Infrastructure. You can find more at sustainableinfrastructure.org. That was co-founded with ASCE, the American Public Works Association, and the American Council of Engineering Companies together with the Paul Zoffness at Harvard University. We use the Envision rating tool, similar as you might use LEED for buildings. And it's a way to help us make sure that the projects we design and construct are built based on the triple bottom line. It's clear that there's more to be done, and I'm privileged to be kicking off this very important step in the process of improving our nation's infrastructure. We all need to work together to ensure our infrastructure is built for the future. We welcome the opportunity to work with you to develop a workable plan and to repair and modernize our nation's infrastructure and foster economic growth. I said it before, there's no magic wand to address this crisis. It didn't happen overnight. We've been working on it now for probably 20 some odd years, and it's not going to be fixed overnight, and there's not going to be somebody else to pay for it. It's each and every one of us in this room, and each and every American. Solving our infrastructure crisis will take collective actions and will take tough choices. Government and the private sector must partner to close our infrastructure deficit, commit to the future in which we improve infrastructure and we value it as a key to our quality of life and our economic prosperity. We don't ever think about it until it breaks. And then we think about it. I've given you a brief overview today, but I want to note that the report card first and foremost lives online, on the website and the app, and you can read the full 16 chapters, uh, categories, you can explore interactive maps, you can do visuals, graphics across all types of infrastructure. You can watch videos on the report card and categories. And as part of ASCE's advocacy efforts, we've made it easy for website visitors and apps to contact their elected officials at all level of government. The issue is too important to be left on the shelf any longer. And I will tell you, as somebody who spends time in Washington, D.C. before Congress and visiting state and local governments, they have to hear from you. They have a lot of issues on their plates. We can sit here in this room today and we can talk about it, but unless you're willing to contact those people that make those decisions, well, it's not going to happen. And I ask you as experts, and some of you are public administration, when was the last time in the city you live in, assuming you don't work for it, you went to the city council meeting when they were talking about raising your water and sewer rates to provide for the infrastructure? And you said, you know what? Infrastructure is important, and I support increase rates to fund our infrastructure. Or you talk to your state legislatures about a need for a gas tax increase. Or here's one. When did you sit down at the dinner table and you have children and you, sit and you talk about how important the infrastructure is? That's what we have to do if we're going to make a change in infrastructure. Well, I want to thank you. I hope I've spurred your interest. I'm happy to take any of the easy questions that you might have uh, this morning. And uh, with that, I'll, I guess, Ed, am I turning it back over to you or just? Uh, I'd, be, I'd be happy to if somebody has one. Okay. Yes. Super map. Um, Sorry, should I repeat everything I said? Um, uh, which, you know, at least drives us to the state level, right, to, to realize that, uh, that we have these significant deficits and that every state's deficit is different, right, because the geography is different, the societies have different needs. Um, you know, if you were um, given the opportunity to drive that down a level or two, what that map, right, the geospatial representation right. of that, because really you click on those maps, it's got more of an infographic, click on it, then right. you get prose that really right. usefully describes the deficits. Right. What do you think that would look like, and uh, how do you see that going down, right. and then 
um, you know, how hard do you think it would be to, to, to do get that? all that information? Because you guys are really hip yeah. deep in, in the data. Let me explain, let's talk a minute just about how we put this thing together. So we do the 16 categories and we're volunteers. I mean, I'm a volunteer. We have paid staff in, in uh, Washington, D.C., our government affairs, they do the writing. So we put together a committee of about 30 experts in those different 16 categories, and we're the interpreters of the data that we do not create, that we gather. So federal level, we got lots of data, you know, and we can pretty do a pretty good job, and we can drill it down to the state level. The problem we run into at local levels, and even the state level, is we don't have staff. And so it's all ASCE volunteers that do it. Uh, and we don't have state report cards for every state. We're up to about 40 to 45, uh, yeah, about 40, low 40s, okay? Because we have to find volunteers, and it's a lot of work when you're a volunteer to put it together. We've had some of our larger uh, groups, uh, Orange County, California, for example, has done a report card. Uh, I think Houston's doing one, if I'm not mistaken. We've had some smaller. When it gets to that level, we just simply don't have the resources or really try to get the volunteers. Now, one of my goals has been that we actually increase our staffing level nationally to at least take over the state report cards. One of the things that, um, that I have found is that, at least from our efforts, okay, it serves as really an advocacy and an education piece to get that conversation going. Whether it's detailed or not doesn't seem to be quite the issue. It's more about, gosh, we got a problem and, and you know, we need to know about it. When you get down to the real local level, at least certainly in large most cases, you know, they've done their master planning, they've, they're big enough to have done a number of the things that they're trying, it, it's really more in my opinion, it has been, and I've seen a lack of communication between what you have as data and the people that make the decision and your customers, your citizens. So we just, the answer is we just don't simply have the resources to go much below where we are right now. We have to review every report card for consistency, you know, this is a brand for ASCE, so we have a brand involved in it that we have to make sure lives up to that brand, and it's, it would be great to be able to do it in quite, quite detail, but I just don't see it because we just don't have those resources. I guess that. And really important, um, I have a suggestion though. You had a number of different infrastructures uh, listed, and, and close talking about emerging technologies. I think it would be useful in the future if it's possible to include broadband. Uh, so there are rural gaps, but also there are problems with speed. Um, there are a lot of emerging technologies, smart cities, technologies, things that we can, uh, so it, there's some overlap with electricity, for example, smart grids, uh, but some of the limits include the broadband right. infrastructure right. that we have here that actually is not one of the best in the world. Um, yeah, we've had that conversation about adding uh, telecommunications and broadband to the report card. Uh, we're also, one of them we're looking to add is stormwater as well as a separate one. Here's what happened. Civil engineers, which is what we are, aren't typically the broadband people, right? So even in our electricity one, we talk about transmission grid, but we don't talk about source. Uh, necessarily. So we're having that debate about what do we do about broadband because that's not, you know, we're not electrical, we're not in the telecommunication industry. Uh, but you're right, as our report card really kind of encompasses America's infrastructure, people don't think about whether we're civil engineers, like they don't even know probably what a civil engineer does or is, you know, we're trying to help them understand that as well. Uh, but we haven't done broadband, I'm sure it'll come up for 2021 because that's our next one to come out. Whether or not we can maybe look outside of our own organization and add an expert or two. The other thing you have to have is the data in order for us to be able to analyze it. And unfortunately, one of the things we do face, certainly like in broadband, electricity, rail, which tend to be owned by private entities as opposed to the public entity, they have to be willing to share their data with us. And a lot of those folks are very proprietary about that. So sometimes we'll go to, I'm gonna make this up, but the National Rail Associate, you know, the, their professional group that represents them to try to get the data so that we can then analyze it. That became a challenge, for example, early on when we were trying to do electricity, you know, and electrical transmission, because it was all proprietary. And either they didn't collect it or they just didn't share it.
Well, let's uh, go ahead and get started again. My name is Hans Van Winkle. I'm with the, uh, well, I'm not with anybody. I'm with myself. <laughs> and uh, when Wayne called me up uh, uh, a couple weeks ago, I guess, and asked if I would be willing to come, I said, sure. It's, a, it's an area I think that we all, as practitioners in this area, all sort of understand the need. And I think we're all a little perplexed by why is it we haven't done any better. I've been following, I remember I, I saw the very first ASC report card. And I thought, that's pretty crummy. It's pretty nice that we're putting it out there. And, and surely in this great country of ours where we identify problems, we solve them, uh, it's going to get better. But in fact, it has not. And, uh, and, and so here we are 20 years later, 20 plus years later, uh, wondering what we're going to do. And, uh, and so I'm hopeful uh, the integration of, of you all working together with, with uh, everyone uh, gets a little bit better. Uh, certainly in this administration, we have a feeling that uh, infrastructure is important. It's one of the main initiatives. Uh, I thought initially that we were going to see something early on because it seemed to have bipartisan support. Um, if you look at the other issues that we tackled uh, nationwide, um, there's a real question of why, why have we not settled in on an infrastructure methodology. And it looks like now that at least the president's uh, goals have been delayed for a bit. Um, and uh, we'll see what happens. Uh, it's great that our, our organizations have gotten together and are trying to solve this problem, trying to move forward. Um, but, but we'll see where things go. Uh, so I'm very pleased to be here with you all. I'm pleased that uh, we can address this issue. And uh, we've got a great panel here. Uh, I, thank, uh, I thank everyone who put this together. Um, I'm not going to go through a, a, a lengthy presentation here. We want to get right to our panelists, which we'll do in just a second. Um, uh, the, the plan is for each one of the, our panelists to give about 15 to 20 minutes. That's a little bit of instruction here, <laughs> and because uh, it's a very interesting topic. And then uh, at the end, we'll have about a half an hour or so, depending on how long our panelists go, to, to answer questions and, and, uh, and see if we can move forward in that regard. Uh, I'm, again, I think the, uh, the, uh, uh, our panelist uh, bio is in your packet. We're very pleased to have Craig Hellman here, who's a senior program manager with the uh, Puget Sound Regional Commission. He'll kick us off. Uh, and then Andre D'Amato is uh, from the other side of the other coast uh, in Massachusetts. We're pleased to have her. She's the Assistant Secretary for Operational Excellence at, uh, at Massachusetts Department of Transportation. Vladimir Lifshitz uh, is right here in town uh, with the Mariposa Association of Governments. And then uh, ending up is Kome uh, Ajise. Uh, he's from Nigeria originally and, uh, and now the Director of Planning at the uh, Southern California. So we have a great panel, uh, geographical diversity. Uh, all of them approach this from a little different, uh, little different perspective. And uh, I'm looking forward. I've seen their presentations. Uh, I'm looking forward to hearing their detailed explanations of what they are doing, how they're approaching these issues. Uh, and then at the very end, if you, uh, what I'd like to do is hold the question till the very end. That gives each of our panelists an opportunity uh, to give their presentation. At the very end, then we'll open it up and we'll, uh, and I'll moderate and we'll see where we go. Anyway, having said that, first of all, I'd like to ask Craig to come to the podium. And Craig, if you kick us off, thank you. Good morning. So I'm happy to be here at Arizona State. I come from the Seattle area. I've actually worked my entire career in the Seattle area. I am actually a Washington Husky, hence the purple tie. Um, so we're Pac-12, yeah, exactly. I noticed the tie, I had to bring it up. My whole entire family, including my wife, we're all civil engineers in my family. My brother is a civil engineer, um, works out in Washington, DC. So I say we're from the other Washington. We're doing a lot in Seattle. We're a rapidly growing place, but I thought I would talk about how we've worked to develop an integrated regional transit network. Give you some perspective, this Puget Sound region, Seattle region, is about four million people today. We're planning to be almost six million people by the year 2050. We have a lot going on. Amazon is our big driver of our population growth right now. We have a ton of tech going on. Um, our four counties are quite diverse from one another. We have 82 cities and towns that make up our area. So we have seven transit agencies. So when I talk about a regional transit network, 
A lot of that work was trying to integrate over seven different transit agencies that are quite diverse. We have a lot of urban area, we have a lot of rural area, and we also have a lot of our growth. We, as the state, I mentioned in Oregon, having strong kind of land use planning. The state of Washington also has a strong growth management act. We, as the regional entity, work to make sure that the people and jobs go into our urban areas, and so that's where we are, you know, in size about 6,300 square miles. But we're trying to get everybody and all their jobs within about 1,000 square miles of our land. We have a large regional transportation plan focused on counties, cities, local transit, sound transit is our regional transit provider. The scorecard from ASC that's brought up, you talked a lot about transit being in poor and failing infrastructure. It's quite different in the Seattle area, but maybe not for a good reason. We were supposed to get Atlanta's system in the 1970s, but our region rejected it. Um, we finally started investing in high capacity transit in the last decade. So kind of that talk before we could have had a regional high capacity transit system where the feds contributed 90% and we contributed 10. It is actually flipped the other way. We have raised a significant amount of revenue to fund those infrastructure investments. The latest package that passed was a $54 billion package funded from property tax. It's also funded from basically sales tax increases and license fees. Interesting wrinkle in the state of Washington, you cannot use state gas tax. We have the second highest gas tax in the country. By a constitutional amendment, we cannot use state gas tax for transit. It is for highway use only. Okay. So why a regional integrated transit network? We have a pretty ambitious plan. And putting it in here, we're looking out to the year 2040, a plan that is about $200 billion of transportation investment. Of those, I'd point to the pie on the right side where you see an orange and a gray, 31 and 22%. Over 53% of that $200 billion is going to transit investment. As I mentioned before, we have tr seven transit providers across our region, and they vary quite dramatically from one another. King County Metro is actually the largest bus system in the country. Everett Transit, which is on there, has seven routes that they operate. So a wide variety of folks, a wide variety of skill sets, a wide variety of tools that they have available. And on top of those seven transit providers, we also have the Washington State Department of Transportation, who's responsible for coordinated and human services plans or special needs transportation. So we've had our regional transportation plans for quite a while. Our existing plans never really integrated the transit networks together. What we had done in the past was we had a major high capacity rail system and all the bus systems just basically grew themselves in place. We had assumptions where basically we would have rail lines overlapping with current bus lines, not thinking about how you connect and integrate those systems together. So our focus of this new updated plan was to really focus on integrating that. So what were those barriers to that integration? As you think about it, and we did all this integration, I'll talk a little bit about the tools we use, and as we have questions and answers, I can tell you a bit more about it. One of the biggest barriers to this, I mentioned, I've mentioned several times, having seven transit agencies, all of various sizes. We only have about half of our transit agencies that even have geographic information systems in place. Most of them function with, if people are familiar with transit agencies, they do all their scheduling and different softwares, there's a few different ones. Almost all of them use HASTIS in our region. Um, so we have HASTIS experts, and it has a geographic component of it. You can kick out your GTFS data from HASTIS for folks to use. But many of our transit agencies don't even have the staff on board who can actually create a GIS map for us. In the past, when our regional entity needed to code the transit networks across the region, we would download their PDFs off of a website, and then we would digitize everybody's route ourselves. And so we would digitize that for the existing year, and then we'd have to think about something for the future year. Hence the reason a lot of the times we took the existing and we grew up the service hours in the future. Lacking that basically geographic information, we could never really highlight what the integration could allow us to do. So what did we do to try to accomplish this integration? We worked really hard together. Our board directed us to create a regional transit network and so all our transit partners worked with us as a transit entity. And I should say my title says Senior Program Manager 
kind of a bureaucratic title. I'm the director of our data group at the Puget Sound Regional Council. So it was our task to actually integrate everybody's systems together in one simple GIS system. We already build our models in our agencies from an enterprise geodatabase. We actually build stuff now from GTFS feeds. People familiar with GTFS is, general transit feed specifications. Um, we actually build everything from GTFS. So we wanted to find a way to get our transit partners to work with us to envision what this future integrated network was in a geographic way. We debated open source GIS software. We're actually an Esri shop, and so we actually debated ArcMap as well. But as I mentioned, only half of our you know, agencies even have access to GIS. We actually purchased a software for folks to use. It's actually not a GIS software. It's a web-based transit planning tool. The advantage of it was people could go and interact in a web interface to get information there that we could then spit out the GTFS. I'll bring it up here. Um, we use a tool if folks have ever heard about Remix. Um, it's a tool that folks use. The whole reason we used it was because it removed the technical barrier for our smaller transit agencies. They actually then worked with us to integrate the bus and rail networks together so that we could then, and I circled it in a red there, but we could just basically through their software output everything as GTFS, bring it into our geo database, and then go on our merry way with all of our analysis. So it allowed our technical group to do the analysis for the region, but also allowed people the access to develop that system and the integrated system together. So some of the highlights of what we tried to do, and I just put a few in here, and if folks are interested later on, um, you can talk about it. What I wanted to focus on is we started to tell the story of what you could get. Um, and so this was basically, we were looking at the kind of transit projects happening throughout the region. I call this a poor man's animation. We've also done the animation stuff, but we basically structure stuff up so that you can go together and see the, the system as it goes across this region. This is the map of our region. To the west or to the left is our most rural county separated by the Puget Sound. Those lines coming across are actually high capacity ferries um, that feed the, basically everything coming in that nexus in the center is downtown Seattle. Um, and then by 2040, a more ex, you know, expansion of the system. This allowed us through our presentations with boards and as we worked with electeds to show what these investments were and where they are reaching. We also got into benefits that we could get from the modeling. So these are travel times. We compared travel times today in cars versus travel times in the future by transit. And you can kind of see we picked specific corridors that really highlight some of that information and how much of the region was actually accessible. And a lot of the parts about highlighting the performance that we could get by having this data in one consistent geospatial format, we could do a lot of analysis about people and jobs. And that really resonates with people. So these simple little bar charts are talking about how many more people and how many more jobs are within a half a mile or a quarter mile of that investment that we're making. And you can see those large increases. Our population is forecasted to increase about 25% um, between now and 2040. And we're talking about basically doubling the access to this frequent system through that. I put this chart up here simply because Seattle is interesting in that while most of the rest of the country has been declining in transit ridership, we've actually been increasing faster than anyone else in the country for the last decade. And we're actually forecasting that to grow even more. And my last two little pictures here, I promised to do this in 15 minutes so Andrea could have an extra five of mine. We did a lot of these travel isochrone maps, and we would do these as, and I took a simple version of this one. This is one place. We'd do these as we went around the region to also try to highlight how much further you could get through this transit investment and what that meant in terms of people and jobs from those areas. This is one city, the Linwood area, um, just north of downtown Seattle. This is today, and you can see that you know, we're saying a little over half a million people and a little over 400,000 jobs are accessible via transit today within an hour that investments that we're making in the future and what you can see in terms of that increasing access is we're getting now over a million people. So that's 20% of our planned population by 2040 would be accessible from this one station node in the city of Linwood. And over 800,000 jobs are accessible. So with that, I know we're gonna do the questions at the end, so I will just look out. Yeah, good, thank you.
Um, well, good morning. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming. This is a great conference. It's a great topic. It's something I live every day. So I'm really um, appreciative of the panel's uh, presentations and the comments that were already made this morning. I'm here to talk about a project that we initiated in um, November. I was given the charge of 100 days to figure out how to plan for a construction season coming forward. And so I'm going to here to tell you a little bit about that, some of the reasons why we're doing it, the challenges, and then I want to dive into some of the data. And if we have time and I have the technological ability, I'll actually show you how the uh, GIS website works. But basically, in, in the Commonwealth right now, um, we're investing billions of dollars to improve the safety and state of good repair of all of our infrastructure. Uh, and it includes everything, bridges, rail, transit, bike, ped, everything. And um, basically, in 2018 alone, we're looking at $2.5 billion to go into our infrastructure uh, to modernize and improve the system. Uh, that translates to about 1,000 public and private projects over from 2018 to 22 in the metro Boston area in particular. And I, that may not sound a lot like a lot to some of you, may sound like a whole lot to some of you, but basically Boston is uh, three square miles downtown, 25 square miles in the region. Um, so it's a lot. It's a real lot of uh, investment going into our into our region. And one of the concerns that the Secretary had is that this is a lot, we've been given a lot of confidence to actually invest, but it also means there's going to be an enormous amount of disruption in a very small area. So the charge was to look at what was going on and try to identify how we could minimize impacts uh, on communities as well as on the different modal uh, opportunities. And can we use any of this to leverage different ways of moving people through our region? And can we use this as an opportunity to identify different mitigation and um, communication methods? So that launched the program. We faced a number of challenges. Um, organization, I mean, this is talked about, Terry started it, and a lot of other folks have already mentioned this. Um, MassDOT has a number of uh, modal entities under it. Highway, MBTA, commuter rail, aviation are all under it. Um, but they really operate as in their own world. And in their own world, they have a number of different departments that also operate in their own world. So um, one of the challenges we had was how do you bring the representative agencies together who have different approaches, ways of looking at it, methods, and data sets, how do we bring them together to actually look at what's going to go on in the region? Additionally, municipalities, and you've heard about it with Craig, and you're going to hear more as the panel speaks uh, on their topics, but municipalities have a, a wide variety of resource capabilities. Uh, and you have Boston to like Lawrence, or you to, to Fitchburg or Worcester. And, most of them don't even have planners, and very few of them have data sets. So trying to get data from them to understand what was going on in the municipalities was a little bit challenging. We've also already heard mention utilities. Utilities. Utilities are a lot of fun to play with. Uh, and we enjoy playing with them. But they're very emergency focused. And so we have to respect the fact that they've got to get in there and deal with emergencies. And the other thing is, is that Boston's growing. Uh, and development is um, a, a significant player. We're doing a lot of air rights work, and they need our infrastructure. Data. Data was one of the single biggest challenges. The highway Department has a mature high, uh, project info system, but I have to say that data is only as good as the operators that input the data and the people that review and analyze that data and reality check that data. And when you're resource constrained, that really doesn't happen an awful lot. But we have a great database in the Highway Department. Not so much on the transit side. Um, so we're actually in the process of building a data uh, system. It's called eBuilder, PMIS. Uh, and we are starting a two-year process of integrating all our assets into that database. And so in two years, it's going to be like awesome. But right now, it's a little bit of a challenge. <laughs> the other thing that we face is the types of projects. Um, when you think about looking at construction activity and coordinating construction activity, people think of um, linear points in space. Uh, I mean, like a, a specific location, specific project. But in transit, they're corridors. And we're looking at how do you coordinate corridors and how do you schedule corridors and how do you integrate that with the other activities that are going around. We also have regional versus local projects. Um, and again, jurisdictional issues are very, very challenging. But we have projects, transportation, like water and energy defies jurisdictional boundaries by definition. It flows. 
And so we need to work really collaboratively within the regions to understand and work to try to mitigate adverse impacts. And then construction periods. Um, different agencies have different construction impacts. Uh, airports are non-peak, but they generate a lot of disruption. Uh, we do a lot of off-peak for highway. Peak is changing in terms of its definition as well. It's now going from like 6 a.m. until 10, and it's starting at 2 and 3 and going to 7. So when you have those windows, and we have nighttime restrictions, we have neighborhood concerns, it really squeezes our ability to plan. So those are some, it's just a couple of challenges, not that big. We could handle it. So the approach we took was fourfold. We basically started collecting data in November. We stopped in February. And we actually pulled as much data as we could from all the respective and, um, uh, entities that were willing to play in our sandbox. We got about over 1,000 projects for 18 to 22, uh, about 250 for 18 alone. Uh, we ended up geocoding all the MBTA transit data, which was one of the best benefits from this endeavor. So we actually have a geocoded database now on our transit projects. But I have to be frank and upfront about it. This is not representative of all our projects. There's only so much we could do in the 100 days about pulling that data in. So it's not the full picture. We brought joint teams together and started weekly meetings at looking at the data. What was the process we wanted to look at? How were we going to define impacts? And what did we want to look to for filters to put on our database? Um, and because we would needed to get ready to launch the April start, basically March of this year for the 2018 construction period, we really didn't have that many tools that we could use. So we pulled together a workshop, a full day workshop, and really like hands on, looked at the database, applied all the filters, and basically was left with the little, the only um, thing we had left, which was resequencing projects. Or actually looking at linear projects a little differently which we actually hadn't done before. So it was a nice thing to do. And then the communications and outreach plan, building on our lessons learned and its dashboard on our GeoDot database, which I hope to be able to show to you today. This is our database portal. This is what it looks like. Um, that's going to go live. So a little bit about the project data. So um, again, this is not reflective of all the projects, but still you can see the impressive amount of projects that we have on the highway and the transit commuter rail side, and the other being development utilities and municipalities. The column on the right is more of what the group decided they wanted to be able to filter by. So we built this into our database, and that was important because we needed to actually get the data on those items to put into our database as well so we could start filtering it properly. Resiliency was a big, big issue that people wanted to see us upload. And I have a lot more that we've come up with since this was started that I'll talk about at the end. So where did it go? So this is only on 2018. I'm going to show you only 2018. Um, so we had 246 total projects. We applied the filters basically simply looking at what was going to require disruption to the commuting public or communities. And so that was anything that had a diversion or a closure. And so this is the data set, and all those dots represent projects. And so out of the 246 projects in the database, we only came up with 115 that had joint impacts. So again, we were looking at joint impacts. If they had, if highway or transit or rail had a project, and we're doing a lot of positive tr train control right now, um, if they didn't have any impacts on the highway or community, we actually didn't include it. We're really looking at integrating the different agencies so we could come up with uh, better strategies for, to mitigate uh, impacts. We uh, identified three hotspots, uh, north, west, and south of Simplicity. For those of you that don't know Boston, how many people here know Boston? Ah, oh, yay, great. Um, so a lot of you might know these areas. Um, so what I'm going to give, walk you through right now is just a sample of what we did for the north area and what the database uh, has allowed us to do. So this is the hotspot mapping. This is 115 projects. We basically screened off the three areas that we wanted to hone in on. Um, they're very, very yellow, very scary. And Boston Metro shouldn't be too much of a surprise. So going down to the Mystic River North, this is a picture of what comes up we identified 11 projects with joint impacts, and they're color-coded by MBTA, private, mass DOT, and we analyzed all the different projects in the workshop. Then we scheduled everything, so we did joint scheduling, which we had never done before, and we did it by peak and non-peak, so we could understand where our windows of opportunity were and where we had to mitigate more appropriately. 
And then we did a high level traffic analysis to try to see where flows were. And basically we identified, it's kind of funny actually, the Tobin Bridge is under construction now. North Washington Bridge goes under construction in July. And Alfred Street Bridge goes under construction in August. Alfred Street Bridge is right by our Charlestown bus yard and it's gonna basically shut down our buses. So this was enough for us to really get, roll our street hands up, our sleeves up and say, okay, we really gotta come up with a different way of mitigating and managing these projects. The really fun part about this, and I know you can't read this, um, you don't need to, uh, a lot of data. Uh, but the fun part about this is we drilled down as multimodal agencies into what our opportunities were and our impediments. And one thing that was really fun was that people were really concerned about our bus routes, which we have not ever typically included in highway projects before. So we looked at all the buses that were going to be impacted and how could we reroute those buses and better manage mobility as well as how to incentivize rail and look at fare structures and create a little bit more fare equity during construction periods. So we use a suite of tools. I mean, most of you are probably familiar with this that have been in the public sector. Uh, but I think the key point of this slide is that we transitioned from a single project construction impact analysis to a multimodal project analysis. And that was not easy, but it was incredibly rewarding. We have defaulted for 2018 to go back to agencies to do the communication mechanisms for impacts because they're really deep into the projects, but now they're armed with all the data from all the other agencies. So what are we doing going forward? We're going to continue the joint interagency communication strategies. Um, we're really looking at how we can identify and incentivize opportunities to do alternative modes. The Boston metro area has a lot of different modal choices, but we don't often get people to switch. And so this, nothing like construction, nothing like shutting down a network to incentivize people to look at different things. One thing we're really interested in doing, and I hope we have some conversation about this today, is partnering a lot more with municipalities to do dedicated bus routes um, and really start stripping parking and using construction as an opportunity to show people they actually work and then therefore incentivizing. It's a lot more economical for us to op optimize our bus routes. When you look at the way technology is changing, the investments we're making in hard infrastructure on rail and transit, I mean, we're not gonna realize those for like 10 or 15 years. Who knows where that technology is going? So if we can get bus routes operating, it's really probably one of the best things we can do for social equity, cost-effective management. And then last, we're trying to think about how to capture some cost of mitigation. Um, we're looking at different ways of doing contracts we're looking at different ways of using flaggers, real-time traffic. Um, we're actually thinking about, can we integrate into the database some real-time video? Um, we haven't got that done yet. We don't really know how to do it, but we start, how can we make this database a little bit more user-friendly for, for um, people who want to use it? So we're going to go live with the Plan Ahead website. I'm in the process of developing a playbook now to institutionalize what we did because it needs to live on beyond our 100 days. Um, we have to do a June-July download for 19 where we have a little bit more opportunity to plan some more creative mitigations and then we'll do hotspot analysis and take it from there. Uh, so what I have, and I don't think we're going to be, we don't have time. Oh, okay, go ahead. Thanks. I don't know how to do this. Oh. So this is the website and I don't know if you guys can click into the plan ahead portal real quickly. Can you do that? No. no. So you guys can go, <laughs> you can click into the plan ahead portal and that'll actually pull, pull you into all the data that we've collected from transit highway and rail. I do have to say though, um, we didn't get a really good response from municipalities and the, one, the response we did get for their data really wasn't very usable. Um, utilities, you know, there is a lot of work that goes on with utilities to coordinate. We get their schedules regularly and we work with them a lot. Be but because of the emergency nature of what they have to do, it's just hard to manage that on a day-to-day -day basis. One of the funny things was that um, our M a Mass Water Resource Authority actually is doing a whole water main replacement that none of us even knew about until we started this project. And so we actually had to resequence a series of our projects around that. So ironically, we went in with the, with the goal of getting all this great data and putting it in a database. and making it available for the public so they could plan their, their whole you know, um, commute more effectively or how they're gonna manage around their neighborhoods. We were all excited about that. And then on the inside, we could use this data to plan our own projects better. All the departments could go in there. 
but it turns out that the only data in there is, is really ours. So now it's going to be a resource for the municipalities to access to do their own planning. We were hoping to help, but it's, we are helping, but in a different way. And then lastly, I would really encourage you, if you can, to go to the Engage Project Impact Review. This is a website that's part of our GeoDot database. This enables us to go to any spot in the map and to access any information, demographics, economics, and now transportation impacts uh, for all our communities. So we're very excited about our GeoDot data set. We're real excited about this project, and thank you for the opportunity to present it to you today. Okay, thank you. Oh wow, so it's talking about getting a D grade for infrastructure and uh, just to put things in perspective, couldn't resist but to say some of the places that uh, I've seen around the world, uh, I wonder what kind of mark they will get and uh, like I'm always thrilled to, to come back home and see infrastructures that we have here. <laughs> but of course we, we play to win and um, that's how we feel at Mark also. But I can tell you that in uh, my consulting experiences from India to Middle East to some European countries to even Canada and United States, uh, our infrastructure uh, looks pretty good. But of course, there is a lot of work to do and uh, this is not to, to diminish the, how important and how critical this issue is and how, how urgent it is actually for America to, to maintain its leadership role. So. You all here right now are uh, in Mark region. Maricopa Association of Governments, it's a metropolitan uh, planning uh, organization for the greater Phoenix area. It's also a regional council of government and I will talk about it a little bit more. But before I do that, uh, I want just to, to show you one of the examples of uh, how different data sets related to infrastructure come together. And it's only proper because right now we're at ASU. So what, what I'm going to show you, and I think one or two people probably have seen it already, but I'm going to show you a modeling we did uh, uh, and data integration effort for now defunct, I think, uh, New Year's party on Mill Avenue that many of you are familiar with. It's pretty big special events with attendance of about, used to be 100 to 150,000 people. And for transportation planning purposes, we do look very carefully at uh, special events in this region. It's it's important aspect of our work, especially for this region. We have total about like five million people coming to the region for a variety of different special events. So what I'm going to show you, integration of traffic, travel, origin destination, purpose of trip, socioeconomic characteristic data, integration of all this various data sets in one single uh, model and that can produce a coherent story about, in this case, special event on Mill Avenue. So Chris, if you please can hit the clip. So what you see right now, a progression through the day, you have a clock, it's five o'clock in the morning. It's uh, December 31st, red desire lines, it's individual trips through various parts of the region to Mill Avenue. Red bars, it's basically people working Appearing uh, purple bars, as you can see as day progresses, it's people already coming to the party to the same area. So you can see now it's all mo almost purple because right now it's seven o'clock at night and people coming exclusively to this area for the purposes of partying as opposite to work and anything else. And the question we had actually from how far and from where these people are coming. Each and every strike is essentially individual trip of a person, it's a person trip. So actually you can see because such a good uh, connectivity in our region, especially of course I'm talking about road network, you can see people coming to Mill Avenue party from all over the region and able to, to reach the, this place in a decent time. And uh, that will be one of the emphases of my, uh, of my presentation that infrastructure map and the infrastructure data, it's much more than just a road map or transit map. It's much more than just putting everything in GIS. Uh, we we'll talk about a complex issue with a variety of different data sets. It's especially true for the MAC region. MAC region is one of the 
large uh, uh, reg uh, regions, in the la one of the largest regions in the country. We have about 4.8 million people in our region. It's also very low density, as you probably figure out. We have about 16,000 square miles uh, in our areas that we collect data for and model. We have numerous, about 27 different uh, municipalities, uh, DOT, uh, Arizona State Department of Tra uh, Transportation, uh, free Indian reservations, and uh, a few other organizations as uh, our regional council members. One of the specific of this, re of the, of this region, one of the reasons we actually have such a good road infrastructure in particular is uh, because is alternative sources of funding. Very few regions in this country uh, are fortunate to have sales tax, and Mark is one of the regions that heavily relies on the sales tax money for the infrastructure funding. You can see on the pie chart here that almost half of our funding uh, for the infrastructure, both transit and road infrastructure, comes from the regional sales ta uh, tax. And the current Proposition 400 uh, that was uh, uh, voted uh, in 2004 into action will expire in 20, uh, uh, 25 at the end of the year, I believe, and uh, we're now preparing for the Proposition 500 in order to continue uh, sales tax funding for the region. So as regional planners, we have a few core products that we must produce by law. So federal government uh, mandates us to produce uh, a regional transportation plan, transportation improvement program, which is basically four or five years, uh, uh, in a sense, list of funded projects, and also, of course, air quality conformity analysis uh, that we co should conduct regularly for each and every regionally significant project. So in order to produce all these documents, we need a lot of data, and we need actually a suite of uh, modeling tools uh, in order to be able to project uh, situation in the future and model different alternative scenarios. And uh, when we talk about data, first thing we think about is what's right now in the field. But honestly, it goes far beyond that. We also need to talk about projected data because all infrastructure projects, they take, as we all know, a very long time. Even planning for these projects takes a very long time. Uh, the South Mountain project that is probably the last big freeway construction in this region that currently is underway, was in works for, for the last probably like 20, 30 years, uh, more like 30 years. And uh, when I was working and consulting in Canada and teaching, actually it was very similar situation. Some big construction, big freeway projects, they, some of them have been in the work 50, 40 years actually. So, <laughs> so it's not very unusual, leave alone just construction time. So we need to project, we need to predict the future, and we also need variety of different data sets. So all these different elements needs to come together, data, projected data policies, funding, in order to, in order to make informed programming decisions and informed investment decisions. And again, uh, this data and these models are complex in their nature. And this slide I just want to illustrate to you just the largest models and data sets that we have to maintain here at MAC. And just by looking at this slide, you can appreciate the complexity uh, of these data sets. Actually, on the right side of, uh, of, the, of the slide, you can see various data sets that we develop and maintain, and many of them are location-based data sets. We just we mentioned today already location-based data. Well, we talk about infrastructure, so infrastructure by its nature is very special right, and temporal also. So many, if not most, of these data sets are location-based data, but it goes again beyond just road network, just transit network. It's also travel data, how people travel. It's travel behavior, behavior data, it's traffic data, it's speed, it's traffic volume. It's also socioeconomic data that pretty much defines travel behavior uh, for the region and uh, nationwide, you can say, also to a certain degree. It's infrastructure data that goes beyond just mapping the networks. It's also land use data that was also mentioned today, which is uh, not a small animal and very difficult to tackle because as a region, we don't really have control over land use data. It's land use data, it's in, well, in different places, different uh, 
levels of governments have authority over it, but again, like it's very often it's, uh, it's, uh, it's cities and towns who have complete authority over land use, which in a sense drastically affects transportation, which is a regional issue, systemic issue, uh, and actually also mega regional issue for that matter. So, the, and on the left side, you see different models, and one of the interesting trends nowadays, and I'm kind of a little bit more technical here, is that merging of data and models. So models used to be very simplified, uh, very uh, analytical tools that, that don't really reflect what and how is in the field and what we actually also collect from the field. Now, with all the advances in computing and modeling, our models awfully resemble data. Uh, if you look at our survey, and if you look at our model, they both model individual people, individual household, interaction between household members. They model each and every GPS trace in the survey, but in the model it's again the same trace. So it's very, very detailed, very disaggregated uh, uh, levels on both data and modeling sites. They're kind of merging and mirroring each other. One of the big issues in this field, technical issues that where we're definitely lacking behind is data integration. If you look at some other fields, such as computer science, uh, you, can, you can look for a product on Amazon and all of a sudden next day an advertisement pops up in seemingly unrelated software that prompts you to buy something very attractive to you, right? So these people know everything about everyone. <laughs> they know how to do it. In transportation, unfortunately, it's not the case. Somebody look at the road and they see traffic volume on the road segment, but does not know who is traveling on this road. Does know anything about land use. Somebody looks at land use, but doesn't have a clue what future highway projects are planned in this area. Somebody looks at socioeconomic data, but again, doesn't have any perception uh, about uh, how this socioeconomic data affects future travel be here. And this is especially critical right now because we're talking about all these transformative mobility trends, autonomous automated vehicles, connected vehicles, changes in demographics and drastic changes in travel behavior of the people. One of the reasons it's so hard to forecast travel behavior is because it's changing. So I was asked this question, we debated it at uh, Transportation Research Board. How come that when you look at the weather forecast, it drastically improved over the past uh, quarter of a century? We actually asked them this question and they told us, the reason our forecast improved is because we now have much more detailed models. So how come we also have now much more detailed models in transportation but accuracy of our forecast didn't improve, essentially. It actually was pretty good in this region because the road network that you see right now, it was almost exactly the same on the map developed like about 40 years ago by Wilbur Smith that I saw back then. So, <laughs> but again, like, what is the reason? Well, the reason is because the weather is uh, guided by laws of physics that don't change, they, f they fixed. And travel behavior, as we can observe from the travel service, is changing all the time. So basically, strictly speaking, you cannot say that this is, this is science, because in science, if you do experiment under exactly the same condition, you should be able to reproduce the result. We can do exactly the same and get very different result. <laughs> So data integration is a very complex issue. I'm not going to go, of course, through all these aspects of it. And this is a slide that I presented actually five years ago at TRB, and we were talking about it even back then. But I won't say that we made a huge progress. There is some progress, but a lot more to do. But the point being that data integration is very complex issue that many, many people are working on it. It's also a multi-billion dollar industry. Back then, five years ago, it was estimated to be about 12, 13 billion dollars just in data integration. I think it's much, much more than right now, probably close, like, I don't know, like, how many, but some estimates I saw, like, 30 to 50 billion dollars at least, just, just in this industry. 
So what's interesting about models, if you look at them, that models are natural data integrators. So we can bring data together in the model because if you don't, you don't have the model. You have to do it. So models basically takes all these uh, disparate data sets and brings them to common denominator and spit out a coherent story about the future that can help you answer the questions. And I want to use here an example from the freight because freight is one of the aspects that goes beyond original boundaries. We developed this very advanced uh, agent-based freight model which, which deals with individual firms and goes all the way ultimately to truck uh, travel and multimodal actually uh, commodity flows and all this. I'll talk about it in a second. But the point being what uh, very quickly you find is that you cannot really model freight if you to at least certain degree don't model it at least nationwide. You cannot just cut off your region and say like I will model freight for my region. That, that doesn't work. So Chris, if you can. So this is basically a, a visualization interface to the model. The first, what you see here, it's a simulated firm. It's firm synthesis. All these uh, bars sticking out, it's uh, the big cluster, it's uh, Phoenix. The smaller one, it's Tucson area, so it's a mega regional model. But it's also had nationwide network. And so we model individual firms first and then as a part of it, we start modeling supply chains and commodity flows. So here you have basically commodity flows and you can play with it and select a certain commodity by NAICS code and, and see from where to where goods are coming and import and export and all these kind of things. And I think this one just a second before was agricultural products. And this shows strong connection to California basically. So you can do it by by the type of commodity. And then ultimately the final step, uh, we're progressing to the truck movement. This is origin destinations uh, for heavy, medium, and light trucks. And again, this shows actually already desire lines from where to where trucks are going. So it's pretty complex model. This is just like quick snapshot for all the main steps uh, of, this, of this model. But it includes and integrates all the infrastructure data as one of the components of this model, but again, there is much more of, the, of it. When we talk about infrastructure, many people understand it as a basically only supply part of it, but there is also demand part of the infrastructure, right? There is no point to talk about necessity to repair the bridge if nobody goes over this bridge in the future, if this bridge is not connected to, any, to anything, and uh, like the one we have here on 64th Street, well, now it's connected, actually, so. <laughs> so so infrastructure, when you talk about it, there is also an aspect of the future. There, are, there is also an aspect of the future travel demand, of the future use of the infrastructure, being road, transit, or any other infrastructure for that matter. So the models help us to address it. And this is another snapshot from the same um, uh, freight aspect I'm, I'm, I'm discussing here. So now we can see, uh, Chris, if you can click on this and one just for a second. Now we can see individual actually trucks movements, which is ultimately output from the model, but exactly the same thing we have from the data when we purchase truck GPS data. So you can see various trucks covered by, uh, colored by the origin of the truck, where is it coming, where is it going from. Every dot is a truck. And we can do it for different types of truck. Same thing again, like we can have for the, for the traffic simulations. You know, traffic simulations, the simulation you can see here, actually we have it region wide. So this is region-wide micro-simulation model that uh, models uh, uh, traffic for the whole region. But as you can see here, it integrates much more information than just infrastructure per se. It's also information about demand, it's temporal information, it's special information, it's land use information, it's everything you can see here. We have the same, uh, uh, and you can see here it's multimodal, so it's actually also models uh, light trail and buses and all these kind of things. And this is downtown Phoenix. This is a presentation from the same model basically on I-10 bottlenecks, as you, you can see. But that's, that's the same model, just di different visualization from the same model. So when we talk about infrastructure, we said we want to be the leaders in this, right? But to what end? Well, 
of course, it's for economic development. It's critical for the economic development, and Mark is very serious about economic development. This is another exercise of integrating various uh, data sets in order to assess uh, economic development sites. And you can see here, actually, it's, it's ASU. So it's an exercise we did for, for ASU in the past. The color is by level of education, because the developer wanted to see accessibility of the sites by different education level for the labor force. So you can see, and, uh, and this is just not visual produced just for that purpose. It's basically just output from the model, again, that integrates all these different data sets together. Um, so just to sum it up, data integration was by one of my hit points and a uh, necessity to look at variety of the data sets, not just at networks. Look in the future also projected and observed data. So thank you very much. Good morning. Well, again, I uh, really appreciate the invitation to, um, to come to ASU today. Uh, I have to acknowledge the fact that uh, I think the Pac-12 is really being underrated. Um, I, owe, I owe a lot of money to USC, and I would like to see the Pac-12 get more, uh, more national exposure as a result. It's really great to be here. It's a great campus. It's my first time on this campus. And uh, I, um, I, I observed on the way from the airport this morning to, to Tempe how wonderful it is to be able to get from an airport to your location in the amount of time that's reasonable for normal human beings as opposed to when you come out of LAX um, to go anywhere. Um, you know, uh, Dean Capel talked about uh, about the place of the university, the role of the university in, in the discussions today as public administrators. We have about 18 uh, four-year universities uh, in the SCAG region, and we interact with just about all of them and use them in some way or other in, in advancing the work that we do. So it's really, it's really a wonderful resource to have access to, uh, to the depth of universities that we have. Uh, in our research and analysis unit, We've, have, we've had upwards of about 20 to 25 interns, mostly graduate students, doctoral students at the various universities working with us on the GIS systems and, and some of the work that we're doing. Anyhow, so getting into the, getting forward into, uh, moving forward into the conversation that we're having this morning, uh, just by way of introduction, the SCAG region is, uh, we have three MPOs here from the Puget Sound to, to MAG and, and, and SCAG. Uh, the SCAG region is the largest MPO in the country. Um, by just in sheer size, we have about 19 million people uh, in the SCAG region. And what uh, Vladimir was describing in terms of the activity-based model, we're actually simulating every one of those 19 million people into the model. And our model will then be able to do some of the fun stuff that you just saw, uh, predicting what every single individual is doing, interacting within households. and and also interacting with the land uses around them. Um, 19 million people, that's about 6% of the US population. In terms of the economy of the Skag region, it's a, just a little over a trillion dollars. If you were a country, it would be about the 15th or the 16th largest economy in the world. Uh, so we have a, a, a real imperative to, to, be, uh, to be very judicious about how we sustain that economy and maintain the competitive edge that the region has. It is the nation's global trade gateway. We have upwards of about 40% of the containerized traffic um, come through the San Pedro ports and then land bridged across the country with the class one railroads that come through the region. Uh, of course, we are charged as the MPO with preparing the regional transportation plan. And in the plan, we grapple with um, things like how our 197 jurisdictions will function and work together. Uh, we have 191 cities and six counties and all our members of, of, this, of SCAG um, and trying to get each one of them to relate to the other because um, the air doesn't know which city it belongs to, it flows back and forth. And quite frankly, 
uh, transportation and the use of it, people could care less what city they lived in. They just, they just need to get from one point to another. Uh, we grapple with a number of issues, um, and these are, these are common issues to all, all regions, um, and we've just highlighted a number of them here. But it's really about the priorities of the residents trying to get access and mobility across the region to jobs. We are at the risk, because of the congestion in the region, we're at the risk of losing um, employment. And we actually have had some major employers move out of the region because it's just so difficult to keep talent um, with the high cost of housing. Uh, we have upwards, uh, uh, we have migration across counties that are really insane. Um, most of the folks that live in, in the Riverside County area tend to work in the LA or, or Orange County. In fact, we, we have this remark where we say most of the jobs in Orange County go to Riverside to sleep. Uh, and that's, that dynamic is, we're talking about two, three hour commutes for some of those people. Um, and so really trying to deal with that is, is really the, the, the work of, of the regional planning agency. And if you can imagine, we expect to grow by another 3.6 million uh, by 2045. Uh, we're working right now on the next iteration of our regional plan, which would be the 2020 plan. It will be uh, hopefully adopted by uh, Regional Council, uh, April of 2020, and the horizon year is 2045. Um, our focus is obviously the quality of life in the region. So these are some things. The current plan is the 2016 plan, and it ad it ad advances some of this um, some of this particular um, um, imperatives. We have expanded rail. At one time, you wouldn't imagine rail in Southern California, but over the last 25 years, the regional rail system has grown by over 500 miles, uh, the Metrolink itself. It didn't exist 26 years ago, 27 years ago. Today, it's about 500 miles of rail, and it's almost indispensable. Actually, it is indispensable because uh, most of those, uh, the mode shift there has been from highway use. Um, active transportation is also another area of uh, bike pad activities. In the last three cycles of funding at the state level and the regional level, we've invested over $500 million in just bike and pad projects in the region. Um, so having been able to coordinate that is also some of the work that we do in the SCAG, at SCAG. Um, so the plan, the 2016 plan, we've, we, we sort of stress tested last year and try to see how, how it's doing. Now, I have to confess that some of the performance in terms of reducing VMT was not because of the policies we put in place, it was because of the recession. Um, so, um, so we were beginning to see an uptick with the return of the economy. Uh, we're seeing an uptick in VMT and, uh, and and, uh, and actually maybe a, 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 the GHG reduction, which is an element of regional planning in California, we have a mandate to reduce uh, greenhouse gas uh, emissions per capita. We had a goal of reducing by 2020 to 1990 levels and by 2030 to be 40% below the 1990 levels and, and, such, and so on and so forth. We, we think we're gonna meet the target for 2020 uh, because of a number of things. Uh, key to that is the fleet in, in the system is, is cleaner uh, for the most part. It, I think generally in California we have about 400,000, close to 400,000 um, zero emission vehicles, hybrids and, and such. And so we're, we're seeing that have an impact as well as um, the fact that we now have more transit and more active transportation. Um, our current plan is about half a trillion dollars um, over time. Uh, we expect the next plan to be even more so because this plan did not account for the recently passed gas tax increase in California, which raises about 5.4 billion a year, and given that South Skag region is about half, roughly half of the state. We imagine a chunk of that will be part of our plan. If 
we sustain the repeal uh, of the gas tax, which is um, heading to the ballot in November. But beyond the uh, gas tax increase, we also seen, we also got a, uh, a boost in Measure M, which was a measure that passed in the Los Angeles area by overwhelming majority that will bring about $120 billion of investments over the next 20, 30 years into the LA uh, County area alone. So that should also augment what we have here. I think the comment was made earlier on about the flipping of investments, state and federal and, and local. Uh, we have about 68 to 70 percent of our investments in the region are from local sources. There are self-help counties. Uh, there are sales tax measures that have been passed locally. Uh, and we also noticed that on the expenditure side, most of that is on operational maintenance. It's just trying to maintain the existing infrastructure that we have in place more than uh, capital improvements. So moving into the future, um, there are a number of things that we are grappling with. Uh, one, obviously, is the sharing economy. How do we plan for it? I think uh, the other panelists have talked about that. Um, it's, it's, a new, it's a new approach to things. It doesn't fit our old model of planning. Uh, planning, obviously, is uh, you, you, want, you want data sets that are in place. Uh, we're having issues with some of the TNCs, uh, the transportation network companies, in their sharing of the information so we can account for it. We feel like most of that, trying to anticipate their role and how they will play into uh, mobility into the future, most of that work will probably be off-model type activity uh, calculations and, and, and work that we do. And how we do that, I think, is part of what we need to grapple with. Internet of Things, um, there are a lot of linkages now. Uh, there are opportunities that go into how we, um, we instrument the system, whether it's the transit system, uh, and you will see we, we have some initiatives that I will touch on in the last six slides of my presentation. Uh, and then the notion of big data, that's something that uh, we've talked about. I think it's, it's become uh, the, the conference topic du jour is, is open data, big data. Um, we actually uh, went into a, uh, the, a subcommittee of our, of our um, board, got together last year, and spent about six months working on what we, what we now call the Future Communities Initiative. Um, and I have to put a picture of my board members in here so I can, I can be, uh, be looked at favorably when I go back and tell them they're, they're on my presentation. Uh, but on our website, you'll see uh, a copy of the report, um, and that's what you have on the, on the left side of the screen. Um, uh, the reason you see a lot of red there, the report was done and completed in November, and the picture was taken in December around Christmas. Um, but I wanted, to, I wanted to show this slide because it was a commitment at the leadership level uh, to this notion of open data, big data. And, and that commitment basically charged the agency. Uh, we have a, uh, just to, be, to, to add to the context, our board is 86 members, 86-member um, board. And many of this, uh, these folks that you see are the officers, the key officers of the board. And they wanted to be part of this conversation about open data, big data. Um, and, and the idea really is how do we bring capacity to 197 jurisdictions such that they all are performing at a benchmark level because there's variation in capacities. Obviously, the city of LA is more sophisticated than the city of, of Bellflower. Um, but how do we make sure that the delivery of services and the decision making is enabled by technology? And that's really the essence of of this effort on open data, big data. Uh, we did a survey of our communities, and 70% of them don't have staff to even do the work. And so we have this process that um, allows us, when we, uh, we're actually in the middle of that right now, what we call a local input process, where we take growth forecast information to each city and we meet one-on-one -on -one with each one of our 191 cities and each one of our six counties. And we're about 70%, 75% of the way there in meeting with each one of them. Uh, in giving them the data that we have, because we, we're a data shop, and, and have them verify parcel information, 
um, projections and subdivision, where, where zoning might be going and things like that, and then reflect that back to us. We found that a lot of them don't have the capacity to even interact with us. And so one of the things we've done is to bring student interns in and second them over to those cities. And as it has, as it has happened most times, a lot of our master's students have been hired by those cities, ultimately as permanent staff to continue the work once they've found uh, usefulness in what they're doing. And, and then in just in the, in, the, in the area of sharing information, trying to get information back to them, we noticed the lack of security. Most of that information is ported over by uh, either by thumb drives or, or by email. Uh, so those are the kinds of things that we want to be uh, finding ways and structures to deal with in the, uh, in the future communities initiative that we just launched uh, recently. Uh, this is sort of a, a schematic of the outcomes of, of the Open Data, Big Data Committee that, the, um, that resulted in, in the Future Communities Initiative. Um, we have what we call data, f data science fellowships, uh, where some private um, uh, philanth philanthropic organizations have actually given us uh, contributions to be able to pay for data scientists, uh, mostly student interns, to work with our communities. Uh, to give them capacity. Um, we have, um, I think the big one that we have right now ongoing and should be in procurement in another day or two is the regional data platform. And what we want to do with that is to say, do exactly what I mentioned earlier on, create this data platform that all communities will be at and be able to interact on and it will be the, the, the base minimum for them to be able to engage in conversations across across the region, on, uh, as it were. And that, that activity um, is, uh, some of the activities funded by our air quality management district. In this case, um, we have funding from the South Coast AQMD uh, through their Mobile Source Air Pollution Reduction Review Committee. Um, we have about $2 million to fund our $8 million program uh, to begin to address some of this issue of creating capacity at the jurisdictional level. Um, and part of what we're looking at is how do we reduce VMT as a result of this effort? Um, and you know, things like um, um, streamlining operations where how jurisdictions handle their fleet, whether it's the, uh, it's the waste disposal fleet, whether it's the, the, the law enforcement fleet, or just the inspectors that go out. Uh, having the data sets and the, and the capacity through, um, uh, through this program to be able to develop uh, ways to manage uh, and reduce VMT just at the fleet level, let alone begin, talk, begin to talk about how people move in general. Um, so this is the regional data platform. Um, this is just a, a, a quick summation of what we're trying to get out of it. We are taking this to procurement and looking for, uh, uh, it's a $2 million procurement to establish that regional platform where all of our cities and counties will be able to interact and be able to upload information real time. What we're trying to, just for us, uh, it takes us in the process of getting ready for the 2020 RTP. We started work on the local input process back in August of last year. Um, as of today, we're about 75% there in terms of meeting one-on-one -on -one with each one of the 197 city, uh, jurisdictions. We want to be able to have a situation where we don't have to have those one-on-one -on -one meetings except where it's absolutely needed. Uh, with this regional data platform, we would hope that that interaction will be done electronically where we can show what we have in terms of data data sets, we have all the information on, on parcel maps for, for all the five million parcels in the region. Um, how do we then get the jurisdiction to engage those, the data we already have in place and upload them? Uh, imagine, uh, if you will, for every permit that's issued real time, that information then goes into the database. So we have real time information rather than have the cycle of looking at things three months and four months and six months out. By the time we get the 2020 RTP published in April of 2020, that information is obsolete. 
uh, that's the basis of the plan. And so having that capacity to have real-time um, parcel information, uh, I think is one, just one small benefit that you can imagine from, from this effort. Um, being able to analyze trends and, anal and do analysis of trends uh, in real time is also one of the elements that we're hoping to get out of it. We have this active trans active transmission has become a really big initiative for this, the Southern California area. And again, you know, most people have an impression, uh, a stereotypical impression that the LA area is just about cars. Uh, we're seeing more and more downtown residential um, I live downtown in downtown LA. I couldn't, I wouldn't have dared do that 10 years ago. Uh, and, and at different times of, of the day, you'll see people walking their dogs and, and riding their bicycles. Um, being able to get real time information on use of active transportation um, uh, infrastructure is one of the things that this data set, this database will do. And so this will be a mobile electronic real-time crowdsourcing type database where people can be able to provide, as it were, real-time information on what they're observing as they use this uh, various uh, elements of, of active transportation. So we have this, we're launching this already, and, and, and it's one element of our, um, of our future communities initiative. So this next six, this is uh, the next three or four, four or five slides will basically talk about how we are trying to engage uh, our communities in the use of data in decision making. Um, the data map is an outcome of our input, uh, local input process. And so each city gets, this is the city of Broadly, Broadly in Imperial County, each city gets a data map which is really a, uh, this is also available electronically, but we found that policymakers like to have something in their hands, and so we actually print a few copies of these data maps and give them to, um, to the city council members and to some of the policymakers in the area. Uh, so each city has a, a data map book, uh, which is a really a full detail of every single data we have on the city and then allows them to, if they want to query it electronically and also geospatially represent whatever information uh, they want from, from the map book. Um, one other element of the map book is allows us to be able to, um, to, to allow cities to make decisions on potential opportunities for investment in infrastructure. Uh, it used to be in the old days in California, redevelopment was a great source of local uh, jurisdictions building infrastructure. And what I mean by redevelopment is using tax increment financing. Um, the law allowed that to happen. It was subsequently abused, and so Governor Brown moved to uh, eradicate um, redevelopment. Once we lost redevelopment, a lot of cities lost some of the capacity to be able to improve their marginal land uses or marginal um, properties. and so. As a follow-on to that, a new law was passed that allowed them to do uh, what we call enhanced infrastructure finance districts, where you can create a district uh, and then use the, the law allows you then to use tax increment to finance infrastructure within that district to generate uh, maybe reuse opportunities for marginal land uses. And so this map book has been very helpful in, in, in that process of allowing uh, cities and, and local jurisdictions to do EIFDs and, and, and be more intelligent in how they, uh, they scope those EIFDs uh, to be able to fund roads, sewer, parks, whatever, you, whatever basic public infrastructure you want to fund within, uh, within the district. Um, so these are some things that some of the opportunities that are created for EIFDs. Um, transit priority is one, is one element of that where you can use tax increment to pay for station area improvements and increase density and, and be able to build aggregate properties to build transit-oriented developments around key transit stops. Um, so these, we, we have a number of them. It's been, it's been very slow going um, for a while, but in the last year, because we've been able to enable folks to be able to see the opportunities through uh, the data sets that we've got gathered, we now have about four or five 
active EIFD considerations going on in the Skag region, more so than anywhere else in the state. Uh, this, is, this is also information on our website that shows the relationship between data and the capacity to be able to identify the uh, investment opportunities in each, in each jurisdiction. Uh, the, the transit supportive measures, uh, because we, uh, we just did a study with the UCLA um, that was very disheartening because it showed uh, we've, we've sort of known that there's been drop in transit ridership in the region uh, in spite of the aggressive investments that we've had in transit in, in the LA region, in the Skag region. Um, I mean, we've spent more on transit than anything else, uh, including highways uh, combined. But then there's been a drop in transit ridership. So UCLA did a study for us, uh, with us, and that study pinpointed um, the, some of the reasons for transit ridership drop. Not to get into that study, one of the things that we are trying to do with this particular um, tool, uh, the Mapping Transit Supported uh, Measures tool, is to uh, allow, again, a crowdsourcing basis to uh, identify activities that are transit supportive um, and then be able to use that to plan what improvements might be necessary along what we call high quality transit uh, areas. Um, identifying um, things like, uh, identifying things like, like parking, uh, where parking might be the problem because we do have uh, some ridiculously cheap parking in downtown LA. I could park in parts of LA for $6 a day. Uh, which is absolutely ridiculous. Um, in San Francisco, you couldn't park for $40 a day, um, but that's the difference in, it's just uh, one of those aberrations of what we call Prop 13. Um, so being able to identify those opportunities where parking might be the problem, where people feel like they have easy access to just drive in, uh, um, that could be a transit supportive uh, uh, opportunity that could be taken advantage of. And so this tool basically allows you to, um, to provide information through mobile sources and, and be able to crowdsource that information in. And basically on our site, you'll be able to see, um, as the information comes in in real time, you, you're able to see that information um, sort of be aggregated. Uh, we also speak in, in more detail on each strategy and provide um, some, some visuals uh, to be able to better reflect uh, the data that's been provided. I think I'll stop there and, and hopefully take questions. Well, thank you to all the panelists. Those were fascinating discussions of how each community region is dealing with these issues that we have in front of us, and certainly of importance to, to all of us. Uh, we now turn it over to you in the audience. Uh, this is an opportunity to ask some questions of our panelists. I th think we have about 30, 40 minutes or so. Uh, turn it over to you to see what you have to say, what questions you have, what, uh, what you'd like to discuss in this manner, and we'll, uh, yes sir, in the back. Could we uh, turn up the volume? We can't hear you, or I can't. <laughs> They can't either. I can tell you I can't. <laughs> and, and by the way, for our, uh, our audience in, uh, hello, Mort, how are you doing? So, um, for our audience in Washington, D.C., we'll take questions from there. I think we have microphones in D.C. as well, right? No, you, this is better, yeah. Um, I have a question for Andrea. I'm just wondering the granularity of this database that you put together, because one of the things that uh, impacts citizens and anywhere in the world and has been a real, a real challenge is scheduling street work. In other words, the electric power company comes in, digs up the road, and then three months later, telecom comes up and digs up the same segment of road, trying to coordinate those things. Is that something you can do now, or is it something you intend to be able to do in the future? Do you need to turn this on? It, hi. Okay, it's on. Um, Unfortunately, if, if I had, could show you the database, I could actually show you how granular it actually does become. Um, one of the big things that we tried to do in the databases 
is link it to our Title VI work that we were doing, because social equity is a huge issue in, um, in our transportation planning and our construction management. We're really trying to provide the modal opportunities in the, in the fairest and best uh, way to provide people access and circulation that they actually need. Our, to answer your question, our goal is to get there. Um, we actually do have the utility database, utility data in our database. It does have it by location, but as you know, working with utilities changes every single day. So I think as um, Comey pointed out, we, right now we're only looking at uploading the data twice a year because the, the just management of that and the scrubbing of that and the QAQCing of the data is just takes an awful lot of time. So by definition, we're not going to get that kind of daily changes. And that's why we want people to go to the individual department websites where they will actually have more up-to-date information. So the other two things that we're trying to do to give us better information is we're partnering a lot with Apple, Waze, Google. Um, actually, they're getting to be a little bit more easy to partner with. They're actually saying that they'll give some of their data back to us that we give to them. So we want to actually use some of that data to actually test the effectiveness of our mitigations, our diversions, uh, and our closures. And so that's where we're going to look going forward, is using the data that we're giving to these providers for their apps and getting it back and finding out how well we're actually able to do it. So that's the real-time data that you know you were also talking about, as well as you, um, we don't. We're thinking about how to do that, but if we can get a real-time video image into our data sets, so the public can click in and say, "Okay, this is my street. This is now. Oh my God, they're moving their trucks in." That might help as well. So we've got these ideas about how what we need to do, given the constraints of our ability to collect and scrub data, how to make those connections so the information we can give it to the public. It's definitely in process, and hopefully by next year we'll be this much better. Yeah, do other panelists have a comment, of course? Like to comment? Well, I think ultimately our, our intent is to make the data as granular as possible. I don't think it necessarily addresses what you're asking in terms of being able to schedule uh, the work and potential delays. Uh, one thing, I, just by just in interest of full disclosure, before I came to SCAG six months ago, I was at Caltrans. I was at the DOT and was the chief operating officer at, C at, at the DOT, was there for 29 years. One thing that we did in the last three or four years at, at Caltrans was to exchange data with Waze, and so we were able to give them our construction maintenance, scheduled construction maintenance closures. Uh, real time two ways, and then they were able to give us um, data on on movement that they were getting from Wazers. And so that exchange was very beneficial uh, in being able to be closer to real time prediction on our information. And so if you go, um, Caltrans has, a, has an app, it's called Quick Map, uh, which I think rivals Waze and Google Map in terms of being able to look at what's happening on the state highway system. That's populated by some more real-time data, including the sensors that they have on the highways. And so that's probably as close as you'll get on the mainline system in terms of real, real life data uh, because it's qualified with scheduled work. Now, if there's an incident, um, you'd have to get that on the news. Uh, and, and hopefully with, with Waze now, you can get closer to real-time on incidents as well. So, so that's, that's a dynamic. I, I think it's, it's really we're playing catch up on being able to timely inform folks. But to bring it back to SCAG, the original data platform that we're working on, the intent is to go beyond just having access to municipalities, cities, and counties to be able to port real-time information or interact and, and make decisions from information information on there. It's also to be able to allow uh, citizens to be able to hack that information and use that to be informed citizenry and interact with their jurisdictions or with the their policymakers, their local policymakers, or with the SCAG board for that matter on data sets that are on there ultimately. But that's the ideal. That's where we're going in the next five years, I imagine. We're doing something similar, but it speaks to a larger issue. There is, uh, there's competition in the private industry to get the data from transportation. And 
the methods that they're using to analyze and giving that information to the public is actually inconsistent. So we also have ways, we're now working with uh, Apple and Google, so, but they're all very different. So our transit agency uses Apple, our highway department uses Waze. And so, you know, what is the, the, the standard operating procedure or the best practice out there to actually work with those providers in a more uniform and consistent basis across regions, across states? Because we're all doing whatever we can, but it's not always the same methodology. Yeah, we had a question from the lady in the back. Can we get her a microphone, please? Uh, just a second, let's uh, get your microphone. We can't hear you up here is why. <laughs> So thank you very much for all the interesting presentation. So my question is about, to all of you, to what extent did you consider the impact of people switching from transit to all these mobility on demand services? And the reason I'm asking this is, this is very important uh, toward the future of AV and shared AVs and all of these Uber and Lyft and you can see the very you significant increased trend of applying of increasing Uber and Lyft ridership to what extent you are considering that when you are investing a lot in your transit infrastructure yeah Craig you want to sure, get started there we go so in our region we're definitely considering that technology um, so a major part of major transit infrastructure investments, so we have a plan, and the, the thing we'd say is, um, is we look and think about how technology is gonna impact future travel behavior. We want to work together and understand how we can maximize the benefit to everyone, right? So these new technologies and these new companies, some people think it will replace transit. We like to think that it enhances people's access to transit. And so we're really working together, transit providers along with the technology companies. So right now our largest transit agency in our region is King County Metro. We're really trying to get and look at mobility as a service. So we don't really care whether you're in a van pool. We have the largest van pool program in the country. We don't really care if you're on a bus or on a train, if you're using a TNC to get to the station. So we're considering how all that works together and a major part of where it comes from in our region, parking is a big deal around transit that drive to access. And what we're trying to get jurisdictions to think about is how this new technology really changes the need for that parking infrastructure and how you could then take that money and reinvest it in other ways. And so right now we actually have agreements with um, Uber and Lyft in our region to provide access that last mile to transit. And so we will actually subsidize that trip um, on, so we have a fixed rate with Uber and Lyft to get you to those major transit hubs so that we're not investing those millions of dollars in parking structures so that we can then actually take that investment and maybe turn it back into transit-oriented development and kind of get a win-win situation out of it. Got yeah, other panelists? Vladimir, you want to? Yeah, well, one of the things that um, it's on. It's on, uh, one of the things that we do is uh, uh, because as a regional council of government, we're planning agencies, so we don't deal as much with operations, we're more about uh, planning horizons. So we're trying to forecast this uh, transformative mobility trends and TNCs and impact of TNCs and autonomous vehicles. So basically our models are tailored in a way that some of the scenarios, if not all of them, can be addressed. For example, if you assume different penetration rates of autonomous vehicles, if you assume different changes in uh, road capacity, things like that, uh, you can run it through the, some advanced model and see what model will predict. And one of the things we're finding, which makes sense, of course, is uh, drastic reduction in, uh, in the need, for example, for parking rights. It doesn't really show complete elimination of transit so far, but honestly, because of the lack of the observed data, you cannot really calibrate and estimate this model of something that's already happening in the field. It's mostly based is on stated preference service when people just express their desires basically and how they would have behaved if something happened on some assertions and assumptions from experts. And that's what we run through the models and trying to predict for longer horizons what will happen. Um, but parking is definitely, I would second that as a huge issue. I just recently 
uh, saw presentation from uh, Urban Land Institute and they put some dollars figures on, on this issue and it's just mind boggling uh, what might happen in terms of land use if indeed uh, it develops as planned. But there is also a lot of speculation, should I say, in this uh, area because nobody really knows for sure what will happen. So I guess we, we're all about to discover how it will progress and we should also keep in mind the recycling times of the fleet. There are people who are buying vehicles as we speak and those are not autonomous vehicles, right? Even though there are some autonomous vehicles <laughs> in some countries and also here I think some tests as well. So it's, uh, we'll have to adjust this for sure, you know, that, that's another thing. Nobody I think has crystal ball at this time. Um, I live in, in an area that has one claim to fame, we have the oldest metro system in the country. So unlike my partner to my right here, um, at, because it's so old, it's, it requires significant investment and um, people don't want to pay for fare increases. Uh, so it's a, it's, a, it's a bind. We're stuck in that bind. Transit ridership in our area has gone down slightly. But we're a very congested urban area, and TNCs are not going to replace that. They're single rides. They are adding to congestion. They're not redu reducing it, so they're adding to time delays. So there will be a role for transit going forward. It's really trying to think strategically about how we make those investments. We're <coughs> making significant investments in rolling stock right now. We have to for state of good repair and safety. And yet we're running into this whole big block here about technology and should we provide some more variable options. I mean, one issue that we deal with is the culture of bus, right? The culture of bus transport. The Secretary often talks about the fact that we should just change the name. We shouldn't call BRTs bus rapid transit because people have an attitude about buses. We should call it rapid transit, rapid bus transit and have people think of the fact that it's actually going to move fast and create corridors for them and partner with municipalities so we can dedicate corridors. We have to think a little bit more strategically about enhancing those options and remaining more viable to provide people the access they need in an affordable way. Well, uh, Comey, did you have a, let me ask Comey to go next. Yeah, yeah I, I, letter. I think we, like I said, we had this transit study um, to try and address what we noticed in transit ridership drop, and before that, it was a lot of anecdotal information that it was the, the drop was because of the TNCs. Um, I think what the study found very clearly was it's not, it wasn't the TNCs, because transit ridership had been dropping before the TNCs showed up, and so we'd seen it continue for the last eight to nine years. Uh, so that's one. Uh, secondly, uh, we also noticed that in the um, part of the issue with transit ridership was in, in the decade from 1990 to about 2000, that decade, uh, for every person that moved into the Skag region, there was a quarter of a car. In other words, for every four people, a car was added to the fleet in the region. The following decade, for every person that moved in, a full car was, was added. And so that was very indicati indicative of transit ridership, access to automobile was more important as a factor uh, than the TNCs. Uh, I think what Craig talked about, what we're seeing is the TNCs are uh, going to be very useful in actually enhancing transit as a last mile, and a lot of our transit properties are beginning to understand that. Uh, we've actually eliminated in Orange County a transit line and replaced that with a TNC ride of up to five bucks. So. Um, there's, uh, there are communities like in Monrovia where in the city limit you, are allow you, you have access to a TNC ride, basically. Uh, it's called Go Monrovia. So there's a number of initiatives that are going on uh, with the use of TNCs, but it will not replace um, the, um, the, the, the transit system or transit opportunities that are available in the region. Vladimir, you had some other comment? Or? Well, actually, I was, uh, I was going to kind of uh, add the same point almost. So uh, all transit is not equal, and we do see decline also in transit ridership for bus. But actually, uh, light rail, it's a different story. Uh, it's maybe competing to some degree with actually SU shuttle right now, <laughs> but, but that's, that's a whole different uh, competition. Yeah, but for TNCs, we do see also some impact, for example, actually, especially in the vicinity of Tempe campus because uh, uh, we see from our service that some people uh, prefer, rather than paying for parking, they actually take Uber for some students actually take Uber. 
uh, to, to the campus and uh, cost-wise it's probably even cheaper than parking here like for the whole day or anything like that. So it definitely has its impact, especially in this area because this area is very proactive, very supportive of these innovative technologies. So it's, ha it's happening all over, especially here around ASU. So, but again, like uh, I would second that the transit is not going away. It might be different transit and different arrangements, but uh, uh, some, uh, some TNCs will be very supportive of transit services, yeah. And I would add, in terms of technology, so we do household travel surveys to understand how people travel and behave and interact with technology. We used to do these about every five, six years. We've actually shifted to doing them every two years to really, because things are changing so dramatically, we want to understand and get ahead of things and understand those impacts. And I would say what was interesting to us is just in Seattle in the last two years, when we, we did it in 2014, we didn't have enough responses for people who use these shared mobility modes to say anything even regionally. And just in two years, it grew so much that we finally actually had enough responses to actually get at things. And what we're finding is our, and so unlike everybody else, we're the anomaly in Seattle right now is transit ridership is growing faster than anywhere else in the country. Um, we've been doing that for the last decade. Part of that is we're actually building our high capacity transit system. That's a big part of it. So we're putting service that wasn't there. But we also have a ginormous company. I mean, we had Microsoft and everybody who's there and they're all still there, but we have Amazon HQ1 who you know, has 50,000 employees in our downtown core, all basically 20-somethings who come to the region as we find in these surveys. Those people have a really interesting way about traveling around the region. We heard the thing earlier, I was thinking about my seven-year-old son who knew the technology. When he started school and he had to use a computer at school, everything at home is a touch screen. The school actually had, still had a mouse connected to the computer. So his first day when he went to use that thing, he didn't understand what this piece of technology <laughs> was over here to use, interact. He was so frustrated that he couldn't touch the screen. And it makes me think about how things are changing so rapidly with technology that we need to understand how people are interacting. Um, and so what we're really trying to do is we make these investments. We're all saying the same thing. Cars aren't going to go away, in my opinion. Buses aren't going to go away. Trains aren't going to go away. Technology is going to serve a major role in how it interacts. And it's important for all of us to be working together to understand that we maximize the benefit of that. But the thing we've got to make sure we do when we're trying to do this we actually were one of the first MPOs. We had an agreement with Uber to actually get at their data in terms of understanding where people were traveling. And it was a win-win situation. It was actually now something that's available publicly for folks that can download. But they were just up the street from us, and so we worked with them so that we could learn how to work together and share the information so we could understand the kind of shared mobility market. They have a market share, so do other people. And so how can we kind of work together to understand how we can maximize all this investment, both public and private. Yeah, this is a fascinating topic. I, I know as someone who came, I spent a lot of time in Europe uh, during my military career, and uh, it seems to me that we're progressing in that fashion whereby uh, you need different modes of transportation. There are many German families that have a car for basically a weekend to go out in the countryside, and during the week they take mass transit and other forms of transportation to do move inside a city. So maybe that's a model. And all our panelists, I think, we're sort of touching on those issues. Uh, do we have some other questions? From we had a, a lady in the yes, ma'am. <coughs> this gentleman over here has been okay. waiting a little bit. So yeah, Hans, a uh, little shift of gear here. I heard earlier, I guess, um, about gas taxes as a way to fund transportation. Um, can you guys comment on that? Because that obviously, um, gasoline, and, and obviously in the LA area, you said he had 400,000 vehicles that are, um, you know, using much less gasoline or no gasoline at this particular point. So in terms of funding sources into the future and how this kind of works out, can the panel talk about that? Yeah, and great question. Anybody well, likes to kick off? Yeah, I can kick that off. The, uh, the Department of Transportation in California actually did a, did a pilot study uh, that was published and sent to the legislature last year on, uh, on road user uh, charge. Um, that, uh, that obviously speaks to the fact that the gasoline tax is not sustainable. Um, for uh, uh, when I was at Caltrans for 
about a decade before I left, we continued to see a drop in revenues from gas taxes, even as, as the fleet was growing uh, in the state. Uh, and part of that is the fleet was getting more efficient in, in, gas, in gas usage, so it was not a viable source of revenue, which was why there was, a, there was a, an emergency, and last year they passed an increase in gas tax to show it up. Uh, my sense is um, it's, it's going to be, it's, it's gonna be a, a, a slow pace. Uh, Oregon's already gone into, into using road user charge. They were kind of, they always lead everybody in, in funding. Uh, they were the ones that give us a gas tax many, many decades ago. Um, and so we're seeing, we're watching that. And I think ultimately when we did the trial, the biggest issue was technology. Um, there were five ways you could record your mileage and everybody going into it was very concerned about privacy. Uh, one obvious way is to use the telematics on your car to record your mileage because a lot of new cars have that. The other was your cell phone or to have a, a, a dongle in the car that would record it. Uh, by far, everybody thought nobody would use those three um, tracking technologies. People would prefer to write it down or call it in, which were the other options you had. But when we did the the trial and people had a chance to switch, most people went to the technology because it was just easier to do. And, and it worked really well and the trial really went well and we're able to be able to show that you can raise the same amount of revenue with a mileage based system. And um, the, the larger issue, uh, I think politically and administratively is how do, you, how do you collect it? Because you can collect gas tax at source right now. And so you only deal with three or four individual companies that pay all of your gas tax into the state coffers as opposed to trying to deal with 36 million drivers every single day. And so the next step in the Caltrans study is how do you do a road user charge as a pay at the pump um, activity where you can pay at the pump while you're, uh, while, while you're showing your mileage. So it's, it's still, I think it's, it's yet to be proven that we would implement in the next few years, but I think it, we have to get there because it's not sustainable to, to raise money with gas taxes. And one thing to add that there might, might be no pump in the future, so <laughs> you cannot collect it at the pump and uh, electric vehicle and just change in, uh, in energy, basically it's one of the biggest threats uh, comparable to autonomous vehicles, if not bigger. Maybe we don't see that many right now, but that's definitely one of the main trends that everybody is debating. So user charges is one thing and um, not much for me to add to the Caltrans study, but I would say there are like different opinions also that not as heavily debated. There is an opinion that maybe we should charge businesses because they're the primary beneficiaries of uh, infrastructure improvement uh, and actually up to the extremes that users will not be charged, the businesses should pay for it. That's uh, <coughs> one thing and uh, Another, another idea that uh, uh, has been debated also is uh, increases in, uh, of course, state taxes. You know, we in Arizona, we didn't have increases for a very, very long time, and that's probably unusual for the country as a whole. So I don't know how popular that idea can be here. But one thing I want to stress, what I mentioned in my presentation, is that sale tax that was passed in this region and in uh, San Diego and some other places proved to be extremely instrumental. We wouldn't have the roads that we have right now if rubberized asphalt developed at ASU, if not for the sales tax basically. We have a great road infrastructure because of the sales tax here. So that, that venue was very innovative back then, I think in 90, 84 then proposition 300 was passed and then 2004 it was renewed proposition 400. So now it's not maybe as innovative but it's really proved its worth. So billions of dollars were collected through the basically a, a half cent sales tax here in the region. So that's, that's another venue that uh, can be debated by, by other places how popular to the waters, that's a different issue, right, of course. Greg, you wanna? Yeah, so we just adopted a new regional transportation plan and a new financial component of it was a, a major key. We, as mentioned earlier, have the second highest gas tax in the country. And Washington State is actually going to implement a pilot study of the road usage charge. 
We actually are planning to be transitioned to a road usage charge by the roughly 2030 timeframe in our region. Um, other parts we looked at, employee head tax was definitely one as well, so a smaller component from employers as well as a shift to a road usage charge, increases in other user fees um, as well to finance the infrastructure, realizing what everyone has said. One, you're buying less, but at the same point, none of us index the gas tax to inflation, and so even if you could still sell the same amount of fuel, you continue to be able to buy less and less with that. Um, and so we've definitely been planning for and are thinking about how we transition away from that, that reliance on the gas tax. One more thing to add that we didn't touch today at all, but when we talk about infrastructure, we kind of forgot air completely. There is a number of large nationwide initiatives uh, related to unmanned aircraft, and we're participating actually in, in some of them. So this will be huge. And it's happening right now as we speak for both freight and actually also passenger travel. And uh, just yesterday I saw basically a working prototype of ambulance, unmanned ambulance that will be uh, able to basically attend to emergencies and deliver people to, uh, to, to, to doctors or to emergency centers. Also for freight, as you know, Amazon is very, very heavily involved, many other agencies as well. So that, that's something to consider, like this kind of infrastructure and how this is taxed and how this is funded, that, that's also another issue, yeah. Hey, let's, uh, let's go to another question. Uh, do uh, the lady over here on the left, I think, is anybody else? Okay. Go ahead, all right. So first of all, congratulations on the amount of data that you've been able to collect. I mean, it's from someone who tries to collect data from our local communities, I understand the challenge. And my question is actually regarding that. I know that you had identified, and I, it's the same things we run into in our data collection as lack of resources, lack of data, lack of communication. But how much did you find that state or local laws, ordinances, policies, or philosophies prevented collecting data or data sharing that once you were, were even able to collect the data, then aggregate the data and then use it in other means, meaning that your communication with Waze or anything like that in order to enhance your processes. I don't. I know here in Arizona, we have we have data sharing legislation that allows us to data share government, but then you're charging for commercial use, and it's there's a lot of. Um, uh, some philosophies about sharing even among data is concern about their local fees being taken from them should you expand your program. And I didn't know if your states themselves were open data states or if you did have those local legislation challenges and how you surmounted them. I know it's, it's a lot to consider all in one question. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, think, I think where we stand is you want to go after data that's not... Um, that's not that's not closed or, or um, proprietary for the most part. I think the data we use don't have that kind of uh, constraints on them. Uh, it's just the issue of where are they and how are they collected. And this the data sets tend to be in different pods and and um, and and the data dictionaries different from one jurisdiction to the other. So so we find that the role that we play for the most part is to bring all the data sources together and try and create a uniform uh, data dictionary and then re-educate everybody about what the new standard language is. Uh, basically, mostly just data hygiene is what we do for the most part to get to a base level. We also find ourselves buying a lot of data. Uh, we spend, I uh, no kidding, millions of dollars buying data from various data sources, whether it's hair data or or uh, iTerris, there are all these data sources on the mobility side that we buy. But the, I think that by far the richest data set that we have is the parcel information. Um, we, um, we have all of the parcel data for every single parcel in our region. And so that's a basis for doing a lot of the land use um, potential. Land, we, can't, we don't do land use planning. I have to quickly just do a disclaimer there so my city councils don't come after me. Uh, we don't do land use planning, but we help, we use that information to be able to create 
um, what might be trip gen and trip, uh, trip attraction type uh, analysis. Uh, just to, 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 to close on that point, we have a, an economic report coming out. Housing is a big, big issue for us in California. I don't know anywhere else. I mean, we are, we have shortage of housing in the entire state, I think to the tune of about half a million units behind in housing supply, and more so in Southern California. So Orange County just did an economic analysis of potential um, housing opportunities. And so what we were able to do is use the data that we have for parcels to identify marginal land uses that could be um, repurposed for uh, densification and, and new housing, housing stock. And being able to map that in the GIS system, uh, I think was really the essence of that data. And what I think ultimately helps is to be able to show that to uh, various cities and, and counties and tell them, here's what you're sitting on that you didn't know, and what, here's what you can do with data. So that education, uh, and the, the iteration of that information of what data you have and what you can do with it, I think helps then to be able to move on to the next level of, of uh, data aggregation. Other panelists? You've heard the expression uh, data rich and information poor. I think that's what, that's what we struggle with. Same with, with Comey, we have the same, we have a, a lot of data available to us. Um, it's, it's what we choose, how we use it, how we scrub it, how we quality control it, you know, what, what's its intent and purpose, right? So with this whole construction coordination project, um, it, it was amazing that we had so much cooperation because we don't have a data, the, the data sharing problems that you're talking about. We can actually share those, that data pretty easily. But it was actually the, the agencies that were the hard ones, right? Because they are so busy they're on the front lines. They're getting their butts kicked by the press every day because it's a national pastime in Boston to just talk about how bad transportation is. And so they're really resource constrained and, and beaten and bruised, and they're looking for a better way to deliver their service. So this project and actually pulling this data in provided this wonderful platform for people to collaborate that we didn't have before because they actually can make a difference. They can make a difference in how they resource plan. They can make a difference in how they actually schedule. And it's far from perfect. We just started it. So it's got a lot of growth to, to happen over the next few years. But the fact that the agencies were willing to so easily come together and sit down and spend time about how many FTEs do you have on this site? Can we use your contract over here? Can we not even do this at all this year? Was really um, one of those benefits. Uh, well, we had actually somewhat different experience. I think it's an excellent question, actually. And we have a lot of limitations uh, on data sharing and uh, actually utilizing the data coming from all sides. From the private sector side, uh, we also purchase a lot of data. Same way, we purchase commercial speed data, we purchase uh, truck GPS data, a variety of other data sets. All these data sets, they come with strings attached. For example, for speed data, we cannot share it with anybody. And we also can only have five users who have access to the data. Uh, it should be a special secured machine and stuff like that. It's all in the data license agreement. Same restrictions uh, or similar restrictions apply to, uh, to GP, GPS data that we buy. The data that we collect ourselves also have, uh, for example, household travel survey data that has individual people, pr uh, uh, basically privately identifiable people. We cannot share this data from, from this reason unless we massage it and do something about it. But also limitations come, and this is probably public administration challenges from these the different like public silos, where they have the data and not necessarily don't want to share it, but you might not be even aware that data exists, or it just like really you need to jump through many, many hoops before you get that to the data. And then of course it's not compatible, all this data sets, so you need to somehow to integrate them, to fuse them together and uh, produce exactly information <laughs> from the data. So, so it is actually useful. Uh, one thing, I think, the constructive thing, the one of the solutions for some of the data that I've seen developing over the past few years, and the, which is, I think, a positive trend, is that sometimes feds actually step in. For example, for speed data, the federal government provided free of charge to MPOs and DOTs, but it's very limited because it's on the, only on the national highway system, which is a very, very small subset of the regional network. 
Similar trend now is happening for the household travel survey data when they collect information about travel behavior. But again, sample is so small that really it's not extremely useful to us. It's useful to a degree, but we still need to go out and spend a few million dollars to collect our own travel survey data. So there are some positive developments, but you're absolutely right. It's, you have all these kind of small silos in government and in the private sector. Private sector, just to conclude, uh, just recently it happened, uh, I, I had trouble establishing like good rapport with, uh, we approached pretty much all big companies, Apple, Google, IBM, and, and so on, and uh, a recent uh, story is very indicative of this, so I had a good rapport with one of the mid managers, Google, so we decided to cooperate, they were interested in our models, our data, all this kind of stuff. In the middle of the meeting, when we were discussing with uh, my bosses present also, and. Uh, and, uh, and Google people, uh, his manager walks in and says this meeting is over, and that was the end of it. <laughs> so so it's, I, I don't know, like I, I'm jealous how you establish good rapport with companies like Google that we really struggle to get anything from them. So, so at best they will tell us, tell, tell us what you need, we might give you analysis results, but we don't need their analysis results, we really need raw data to make it useful for, for our purposes. So. So that's a challenge, definitely, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we're nearing the end of our time. I got a question, but I didn't give an opportunity for anybody in Washington to uh, have any questions, but uh, we need to end here shortly, but I thought I'd check. We okay in Washington? Can you hear me? It's a little delayed. Oh, we're good. <laughs> <laughs> you good, you said? Okay. <laughs> uh, Great, I had a gentleman in the back. Let's do this the last question here. We need to end on time. Uh, quick question, uh, and then we'll, uh, we'll close it off. Great, uh, my name is Chris Richardson. I'm with Arizona State University in our central IT organization. And uh, my question, I think, is in the spirit of the panel, you know, integrating GIS across jurisdictions to enable smart infrastructure. Um, I'd be curious that if you could imagine a relationship with your largest university, um, what what problem would you solve to work with them to integrate GIS type data? And um, what data would you want from them? And, and what data could you give to solve that problem? Uh, and, Craig, and do you want to? We can start, we, we can end with Maricopa just because I'd uh. be curious to see. <laughs> well, uh, I, I, I can just say a few. Well, first of all, it's, it's happened and it is happening. And we actually have official memorandum of uh, agreement signed by Mark and ASU. And we're very closely cooperating with, uh, maybe not with uh, all the relevant programs, but uh, with many of them. And uh, this cooperation has different natures. Sometimes it's just information exchange. Sometimes it's something much more involved when we together work on different projects. So I think it's happening. I think it's a matter of, uh, uh, I don't think there is any resistance to this kind of uh, type of cooperation or collaboration. It's encouraged, especially with your local universities, you know. So uh, at least from my perspective, uh, I don't see an issue here. I think if there is, a, where is a will, you know, there is a way. So, so basically, if, if you're willing to enable, you'll find a way to cooperate and capitalize on university research. It's also another venue for this, which is very good venue, is TRB. Transportation Research Board, uh, which is basically all leading academics in transportation are pretty much very actively participate in the activities of the board. So a lot of cooperation with different universities who are not local to us is happening through TRB. So we have some work that we're doing with them. So, but uh, it's really not a new thing. It, it, it's happening and it's, uh, uh, it's been, it has been happening for quite a while by now. So. Yeah. I, I had this opportunity uh, a few years ago when I was a commissioner. I used to be the commissioner of the city of Boston, and I had an opportunity to go to Europe and, and visit with some of the universities and look at their university partnerships with local municipalities, and I've never forgot it. It is a, it's an amazing partnership, and the um, relationship and the products that come out of that kind of government-incentivized um, program are just outstanding. That being said, um, we also have a wealth of a lot of higher ed universities and colleges in Massachusetts, and the DOT has a strong partnership with our university system. And we work with, we actually fund research 
uh, and through them we actually have a competition around what research, so our, our staff will generate things we actually need research on and we farm it out to universities and they will pick it up and do some research on the, on the uh, topic of interest. We've had a lot of work on drones, rapid transit, bus rapid transit and technology. Um, for us, I would love some help on our GIS database. You know, looking at how to do what we want to do going forward, getting that kind of real-time information, it, doing a lot more integration, that would be like perfect for university collaboration. In Seattle, we work a lot with the University of Washington. The um, data science for the social good has been a big part of what we do. Specific to your question, we're working directly with one of our urban planning um, professors to get sidewalk data into OSM. We're moving all of our network stuff to OSM. And so they've already open street map. They've already started doing this, coding sidewalks as ways in the city of Seattle, and they're working with us to then expand that out to our region. Um, so we've done, a, and we actually do a lot. We also have transit pass data. When you ride a, a bus or a train in Seattle and you pay with a ORCA card, it's a transaction and stuff is recorded. We've actually worked with our computer science departments on that data to actually get OD information from it, and so. We've actually gotten some really interesting geospatial data from that. Um, we work a lot with the University of Washington especially. We team up on um, proposals all the time and definitely see a lot of value in working with our university partners. Kwame, do you want to make a last comment here? Sure. sure. I think there, there are three you things know. to note there is a lot, the universities actually come to us because we have, we have the basis for them to do a lot of research off of the data that we have. Uh, and, and we have to also have to be very careful to not pick, uh, make friends too friendly with one university over the other then because you get, you get slammed in Southern California if you're pro UCLA or pro USC. So we try to play equally with them and they do work with us very closely. Uh, in fact, I think June 11th, there will be a demographic workshop. We've done, we've done this about, I hear about 29 years now or so. Um, that we co-sponsor with USC at USC, uh, and it's mostly about data. I think the issue is more about the data. The GIS system itself, we are, we are the place to go to for GIS uh, and, and, the use, and the tool itself. And so a lot of the universities come to us to use our system. We also have international relationships. Uh, tomorrow will be our first uh, Future Communities Forum. Um, at Inland, uh, Indian Wells, it's part of our General Assembly. So a day before, our General Assembly is Thursday and Friday, and so the Wednesday before, we're gonna have all day uh, workshop on nothing but data. And we have a panel of some of our foreign partners from Taiwan, Korea, and, and China um, that collaborate with us on data. Uh, and how that's happened is we've had, uh, we've had, uh, tra um, international trips between us and several universities like the uh, CODI, I think it's K-O-T-I, the Korean Transportation Institute. We have a very strong relationship with them. And so we have international uh, collaborations as well. So I, I think the issue on data is uh, with the universities is not so much what else they could do. It's really just finding more granular data that we could use to enhance the, uh, what comes out of the GIS system that we have. Uh, let, let me, I think we've run just a little bit over. I think it's time to, to end. Um, and let me thank our panelists for a great presentation, uh, great presentation and great question and answer. Let me thank the audience as well for some very stimulating questions for all of us. And having said that, I think it's uh, time for a break and some lunch. Thank you very much. Thank you. Nice job, guys. <laughs> nice work. We have just a few minutes for a break and we'll reconvene here for our keynote speech in five minutes.
Hello? Hello? Shall we just gather back again real quick? Hello. We'll get started. I get used to this. <clears throat> so um, first of all, um, I don't know whether you've noticed, but, but Tom Clemens, our keynote speaker, is, has, has had a little video from the 1950s uh, and Walt Disney playing. Um, and so it's pretty interesting video uh, for you to watch, particularly when we start thinking about the highway of the future and, and infra infrastructure uh, systems. Uh, what a great start to a, a great day. So um, first of all, I want to say thank you to uh, ASCE and, and to our panel members uh, who got us launched. I'm Wayne Crew. I'm the General Secretary of the National Academy of Construction. Just real briefly, the Academy uh, was formed 19 years ago to recognize individuals who've made significant contributions to the design and the construction industry. Uh, today, we're just under 300 members. We're growing. Um, of course, our industry continues to grow. Uh, we've got an incredible uh, group of leaders and, and, and people in this, in this industry who've made significant contributions, which equates to a significant contribution to our nation. Um, and as we've grown, in addition to honoring those individuals, uh, the National Academy of Construction has is, is also uh, been looking at where we can make significant contributions from the collective academy and its wisdom and experience to the nation. And, and so the opportunity to partner with Arizona State and the American Geographical Society and the National Academy of Public Inf Administration focused on infrastructure and how how important that is to uh, our nation's uh, future and, and to the livelihood of every one of us uh, is just an exciting opportunity for us. And so, so we're excited to be that, that partner. It's also pretty exciting to have the technology of Arizona State so I can look on the screen and see when I'm not on the highway of the future uh, members of the National Academy of Construction that I know uh, sitting there in Washington, D.C. So what an exciting um, facility that Arizona State is letting us use, and, and I'm so grateful to you all for that. Thank you. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, our keynote today. Our keynote is Tom Clements. He's the Executive Advisor of Transportation Systems with, with Bentley Systems. Um, <clears throat> Tom graduated from Texas State. 37 years ago uh, with a degree in engineering sciences and, and during his 37-year career working with uh, Hewitt Packard and Integraph and Oracle and now Bentley Systems, he has been in service to our state and local uh, transportation agencies in one capacity or another. Um, the majority of his work has been focused on the utilization of computer software applications in civil engineering and that includes geospatial technologies uh, in, in support of solving transportation challenges. He's often represented the private sector on both, notice, both Republican and Democratic uh, gubernatorial summits on, on their infrastructure. Uh, he's very active in the transportation industry in AASHTO, the American Association of Highways and Transportation Officials in the Urban and Regional Information Systems Association, the Government Technology Conference Advisory Board, the State Legislative uh, Leaders Foundation Industry Advisory Council, and the National States Geographic Information Council. So it's my pleasure to welcome my friend Tom Clements to uh, speak to us today. So good morning. Uh, I'm the only uh, thing between you and lunch. As Wayne said, well, it could be worse. It could be uh, drinks and happy hour. So um, I, I applaud uh, what you're doing. Um, you know, what we do is about people and places. When, when, when you become a parent, 
and maybe even more importantly, when you become a grandparent, it changes your life. So, so the, uh, the Disney video uh, was a perfect segue to this picture, which I added at 4 o'clock this morning. Um, that's my three, three grandchildren. We're at Epcot. You might even recognize that bridge. That's, that's, uh, we were waiting for our Thanksgiving lunch in, in Japan where they have the, uh, where they have the, the group serving. But um, it does change how we start to look at things. I, I'm retiring for the second time, and, and it's a real pleasure to be in a position where where you're working because you uh, do it for a passion, you have a cause, and, and you do it because of uh, colleagues that you've spent your whole career with. I, I've spent my whole career in the transportation infrastructure, and uh, I just applaud what you're doing. And, and so I'll, I'll say more about that um, at the end. Um, I didn't know any of those people in those pictures except Tom Warren in the upper left, who was the father of design build. He was the director of Utah DOT during the uh, Winter Olympics when they learned how to do design build. Uh, but now I know Terry and Wayne and some other people. So uh, I've, I've recognized uh, the three groups work for many, many years. So it's, a, it's an honor and privilege to spend some time with you. Uh, Chris, is it Chris? Chris Tucker, one of the Tucker brothers. There he is. So I applaud Chris, too, for the bravery to even create this map. I mean, it's incredible. I was really impressed that you've got the Ogallala uh, underground aquifers there, too, that go all the way down into Texas. We, I'm from Austin, Texas. Uh, we have, I think, nine major aquifers in the state of uh, Texas. Uh, I believe San Antonio is the largest city in the world that's 100% dependent on an underground source of water, which is the Edwards Underground Aquifer there. And, and I think it's very doable to do an infrastructure map. Look at, uh, look at the panel that was up here this morning. Look at the level of detail that they talked about for their, for their counties, for their, for their COGS, for their MPOs, for their cities. And I, and I couldn't agree with uh, Terry anymore to say it's, it's not a technology issue. It really is not a technology issue. Um, what, what is the issue? Anybody? Leadership. I think you nailed it. Leadership. Uh, funding, although, although frankly, I think we can overcome the funding. I think it is about the people and the passion and the evangelism. Um, the other Tucker, John, said, oh, be sure you include some maps. So, so, so I, again, I added these maps. So that's the National Bridge uh, uh, inventory infrastructure. Those, those happen to be, uh, those, those points of red, not points of light, are the uh, 55,000 deficient bridges in the United States. Not posted bridges, okay? That gets misunderstood often. Deficient bridges. You know, they're not in a good state of repair. They need work. But they're still functioning. And, and, and this bridge, I have, to, I have to tell you exactly where that is. I don't want to uh, miss that. That's in uh, New Jersey. Uh, it is um, Route 35, Perth Amboy. Now, now, do you think that sign up there didn't get someone's attention? <laughs> Notice there's no traffic on that road. There's no one passing under that bridge because they hung that sign up saying, you know, it's like the scarlet uh, red letter <laughs> that they hung on the bridge. The, uh, the map to the right, of course, is our national highway system, 163,000 miles. Uh, of, of both uh, major interstate system and major arterials. So again, there are incredibly uh, detailed uh, uh, infrastructure maps out there. Uh, you know, I'll, I, will, I will try not to give any uh, uh, product messages, but I, but I think MicroStation 1.0, which is developed in the 
1983, you know, had reference file capabilities in multiple layers. So, so the technology has been there for many years to support all these different layers and as the metadata technology has evolved to support the graphics, all, all of that is there today. So I have to uh, give these two icons uh, a plug. You probably recognize the, the gentleman and his, and his partner, his spouse on the left, Jack and Laura Dangerman. Uh, Jack would give credit to lots of other people uh, as to who is the father of GIS, but certainly around the world, Jack Dangerman is considered the fa father of GIS. Um, Less known, those are those are the five Bentley brothers at the bottom right, and that's Keith and uh, Keith and Greg Bentley. Greg would have loved to have been here. He's a, he's a member of the Academy of Construction, but he's at a McKinsey uh, event on on infrastructure today. Um, so I symbolically uh, bring up these two gentlemen. They sort of represent the GIS world and the, and the engineering world, if you will, in terms of data, of information. Um, another issue that's often brought up is, uh, is the integration of engineering data and CAD GIS data. And, and I do think that is a real, y'all can, I'll ask for a show of hands and even the part of our discussion, I've, I've dealt with, um, planners and civil engineers and surveyors and bridge engineers all my career. And so there is still room, room for improvement organizationally in our, in our agencies to, um, to, to deal with that information of, uh, of uh, who, who owns the data and sharing data and totally look at each other as, as partners in, in sharing this data. Although I didn't hear anyone bring up this morning the issue of, uh, of GIS CAD interoperability, so, so maybe I'm all wrong. Maybe it's not an issue. <laughs> I know at the Ashto GIS conference for the last 30 years, which I've been to every one of them, uh, they, all, they, had, they do a survey of, of every uh, DOT in the United States, and, and one of the top three issues every year for the last 25 years has been CAD GIS interoperability. Now it wasn't it wasn't this year, uh, right? It was asset management and it was other things. So so in fact that was promising. Uh, I'll also say that these these uh, two gentlemen representing these companies I think would be tremendous advocates of what we would like to achieve, and they would specifically be advocates of ongoing summits, maybe take it one, one, one year at a time, but summit number two, uh, they, they would be advocates for that, and they would also be two, they'd be, they'd be great to have up here as a two-person panel <laughs> to talk about, because they, they both understand every aspect of what we're talking about, from the most minute uh, technical detail to, to the financial and investment detail. And, and, they're, and they're frankly two of the hardest working technology CEOs in the world. It's incredible how hard they work at their job. Plus, these are two privately owned companies, okay? They're both uh, top 10 technology companies in the world, uh, privately owned. And that does make a difference. They're making decisions that aren't necessarily based on uh, uh, the quarterly stock reports three months from now. And, and they never have. So they've been in this business for 30, 40, Jack, from 1969. Uh, and so they, they make their decisions based on very long-term decisions. And they're also at that age where they want to give back. I, I just saw in a press release where Jack and Laura donated uh, uh, land on the California coast appraised at $163 million. Now, yes, there were probably some tax benefits to that, but still, <laughs> he, he didn't need to do that. So, incredible icons of our industry. Um, I, I love the, and I meant to bring the handout, the uh, ASCE uh, report card. I, I love that report. I think it does get incredible visibility uh, of the right kind, because I think we do have to get uh, 
we have to get both the public's attention and we have to get elected officials' attention. But what I think we need to do a better job of is talking about what we are doing so well as an industry. I, I'm very close to, to users, have been my whole career through user group meetings, through events, and there is incredible work going on. You just, you saw four examples of, of it uh, up here today. What, what I know best is the State Departments of Transportation and and, and here's some loco, logos of a, a lot of those states. I'm leaving many out, but, but I'll just very quickly go through uh, some of the incredible accomplishments that some of these states are making and you're, and you're their partners in doing that. Um, uh, I'll, st I'll start with Utah down in the lower right because I mentioned uh, Tom Warren earlier. When they, when they uh, hosted the 2000 Olymp Winter Olympics, um, they had eight years of project work that had to be done in three years. So they came up with innovative, uh, innovative, creative ways to do that work and, and that's when finally design build in the United States became, started to be introduced. It's been used around the world for 20, 30 years, but, but finally in the U.S. we started to do design build where, where you gave the private sector more flexibility to do that job. You didn't do design, bid, bill, where you outline ever, ever detailed specification. You gave flexibility to that uh, contractor and that consultant. Um, at the same time, that's also when they figured out that doing construction after hours was very simple, but very smart. Now, it wasn't easy to get started, as you can imagine, uh, but they gave incentives and they started with big projects initially and all the construction were the, for those big projects were done from after 8, after 9, 10 p.m. and ended in the morning, okay? Now there was resistance to that, uh, as you can imagine. Not everybody wants to work those hours. They actually uh, incentivized them, gave them bonuses. They made the case in many ways the benefits would be just overwhelming. It would be safer. It would be safer for the workers. It would save fuel. It would be more efficient uh, and it would save invaluable time. And most importantly, it would change the perception of the public about what, what you see when you see construction going on. You see barriers, okay? It's been incredibly successful for them. Uh, they no longer need to give incentives. Their contractors and consultants wouldn't do it any other way. They do all major construction after hours. And as a result, they have incredible credibility with the public. And guess what? When the public's happy, who else is happy? The state legislature is very happy. And they get they have the most incredible working relationship uh, in the state of Utah with their legislature that, that I've seen anywhere. And, and, it, and it could be uh, easily emulated. Now, I can imagine probably uh, unions and other people wouldn't like that at all, but, but you know, if we're, if we're approaching something for the right reasons, you know, there's a lot of things that we can accomplish. Um, Connecticut, Iowa, I've got uh, Florida, there are three of the states uh, in, in the civil industry, uh, we call BIM, SIM, Civil Integrated Management. So, and, and my friends on the vertical side, they're always saying, well, Tom, why, 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 don't, why, are, so civil, why are civil engineers so far behind, you know? Have you, ever, have you ever heard that, you know? Why have we been doing BIM in the vertical industry for 20 years, but, but we don't do it with highways and bridges? Well, there's a good answer for that. You just say, are any of your projects big enough to where you have to consider the curvature of the earth, the z-axis? <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and they're not. So if you're, doing, uh, if you're doing civil jobs anything more than a mile, it, it does get more complex. Now, did we solve that 25 years ago? Yeah, actually we did, so it's, it's not a very good reason, but um, but the civil industry, for good reasons, is very, is very conservative. Uh, you know, we don't want I-35 bridge collapses, of course, 
and for good reason, we, we are conservative because it's uh, life and death issues. Um, Michigan, there's eight, there's eight EMs. It's always funny, they all call themselves MDOT, but that's Michigan DOT. Michigan's used a very simple tool to, to uh, now be 100% paperless. They use a data management application that allows them to not uh, produce a, a single piece of paper. They have gone 100% paperless. It's called e-construction. It's actually a very simple application and they've saved uh, millions of dollars by going paperless. How long have we been hearing about let's go paperless? So it's actually finally happening. Uh, TxDOT's done the same thing. Um, Oregon is another state. Uh, somebody here was from Portland. Uh, Oregon, Connecticut, Iowa, they are, they are all leaders in uh, asset management and what's uh, called civil integrated management where you integrate the data. The goal is to take a single piece of data that's captured at data collection and that data is used all the way through all the traditional five phases of the project life cycle, life cycle analysis and life cycle management. Um, someone mentioned a concern of uh, haves and have nots. You know, I think it was Senator uh, Inhofe of Oklahoma years ago who created the word or popularized the word uh, devolution. And, and if, and if uh, Senator Imhoff had talked to us today, he said that was, that was a big mistake. And there is a tendency for Congress to say, oh, our states, why can't our states provide all this funding? And there's been a tendency, we're up to now 32 states in the last five years who have uh, supplemented their funding because of the lack of congressional leadership. And, um, and wh whether it's with sales tax or gas tax, uh, Texas is certainly one of those, you know. But how many states have a whole a huge uh, amount of funding from oil wells, you know, to supplement that? I mean, Texas draws a billion, has uh, dedicated over a billion dollars a year now from their oil revenues to, to their infrastructure. Um, they have $70 billion dedicated for the next 10 years for their infrastructure. Florida has their tollways. So there, there is a risk of the haves and have nots evolving. And we absolutely have to have a, a federally supported integrated system. Otherwise, you get down to individual state uh, priorities of why would Wyoming care so much about maintaining their interstate system when it's all about trucks that are passing through from the east to the west or vice versa? So we absolutely, it's critical we have a federal uh, system. And of course, uh, one state I failed to mention was Arizona. I was talking with Paul earlier. Have you been in any uh, major city in the United States that had a more beautiful, aesthetically pleasing highway system than Phoenix. I mean, it's incredible. And that started years ago with the leadership of people like Mary Peters and Victor Mendez and now John Halakowski teaming with, uh, with MacDot and cities and counties where they, the DOT uh, probably initially made that investment and, and they saw the results of it, and, and then everybody got, in board, got on board with that. The same way you see, um, same way you see a light rail in a city like Dallas now uh, becoming very successful. You don't think of Texas as being mass tra uh, transportation oriented, do you? But Houston has a great transit system. Dallas has a great light rail system that are uh, uh, really moving forward. Here's another area because this is all about return on investment. I sat down a few weeks ago with a gentleman uh, post Hurricane Harvey in Texas where he said it has never been more plain at the highest levels of government that, that we have not invested in our, uh, the inventory of our assets. Uh, the destruction that came about from uh, Hurricane Harvey was just des devastating. And it literally, not only the lack of good information, but the ability to share that information is impeding the restoration of the economy of an entire state. And of course that happened to be down in that whole Gulf Coast uh, 
uh, energy, petrochemical, oil, so, so the impacts were horrendous. Uh, you see a map down on your lower right. Uh, I heard other areas talking about this. That is, that was the real star of Hurricane Harvey. It is the public facing web-based uh, road condition um, map for the state of Texas that's hosted by Texas DOT. And, and with that system that was based on cameras and sensors, you know, they were able to get real-time information on road conditions and uh, doing the routing and reversing the, uh, reversing the lanes. And so it was, technology played a huge role there. One of the amazing things of that hurricane, um, you see the light blue color there, literally the National Weather Service had to create a new color to represent the capacity and the volume of rain uh, greater than 40 inches uh, in a 24 hour period. So it was just, so, so you see these disa natural disasters coming more and more frequently. I won't get into the politics of that, but the governors, Governor Kate Brown of Oregon understands this incredibly well. Governor uh, Wolf of Pennsylvania, uh, on and on. Governor Scott of Florida, they understand uh, through these natural disasters and the impacts that we absolutely have to invest in our infrastructure and these systems that, that those of you are here today and in DC have invested your lives uh, developing. So, so they are our future and uh, an infrastructure map absolutely uh, should be part of that. I happen to think the sort of the branding of smart cities is a really uh, good approach. We all, what, what do we relate to? We relate to where we live. We relate to where we live, whether it's a small city, a big city. Uh, I think we have to be careful that it doesn't get overused. What do you think of when someone says, um, Oh, to be completely honest, you know, when someone says that, <laughs> the first thing I think of is, <laughs> is I'm getting uh, anything but honesty. So, I, so, so overuse of the word smart is something I think we need to be careful about. But I do think, I do think the smart city approach uh, can tie both federal and state and everybody together into a partnership. In, in Austin, Texas, we have definitely seen the reversal of urban sprawl. I don't know if you're starting to see that, and we're, we're maybe the exception in Texas for that, but, um, but I can imagine in Arizona, like Texas, land has always been cheap, and so the tendency was to sprawl, sprawl, sprawl. But as you run into the foothills, as we get smarter about our inter environmental uh, regulations, our zoning, uh, I think the tendency is, uh, is, is, is changing to where our dense, uh, smart densities and coming downtown and leaving downtown, just as Comey talked about. I could not, I looked for this online. This is, uh, this is an article that, that my boss wrote for McKinsey. Uh, it's an, it's an excellent paper, a short paper, that's all about uh, what's represented here. Going digital, it's the phases of the life cycle, the advancing uh, infrastructure, and, and of course it's all about the cloud. As you've noticed, the cloud is the new mainframe. Uh, information technology just evolves. We had the mainframe, the minis, the desktop, the client server, and now, and now the cloud is really uh, replacing the mainframe, but there are a lot of, uh, you, you're probably not having any software companies uh, lower your enterprise license charges, your hardware costs are going down, and, the, and your ability to implement your new applications and updates across the cloud should save you a lot of money, certainly. So I'd be remiss if I did not recognize the importance of the construction industry. Uh, we often Think about that as the as the as the um, uh, bottom of the supply chain, if you will. But it really was the construction industry going back 10 years ago. And if you were listening to the audio, I thought it was strange that they showed those stakes because it's now totally stakeless, stakeless construction, and that was their point there. 
but when the construction industry uh, moved to laser guided and GPS uh, equipment, uh, it, it was revolutionary because the savings of fuel, the reduction in CO2 emissions, the savings of 25, 30% time of a big project has just been immense. And credit to the owners who, who provide a lot of incentives, often significant bonuses to uh, finish on time and on budget. And, and the demand then of construction industry of the owners to provide them 3D modeling uh, so that they could move that forward has really been uh, significant in our industry. So here's a significant part of this, and hopefully this will be uh, prompt some discussions later in the day. Um, I think one of the most significant things that needs to happen related to an infrastructure map is a look at uh, standards, okay? Uh, we've seen, as a matter of uh, need, we've seen uh, standardizing on products. Um, uh, the gentleman who moderated before us, he was in the military. Many years ago, the Air Force, the Corps of Engineers, and all the military branches literally required uh, Autodesk and Bentley to, to provide a common uh, translator. It was called DXF, okay? So, but we need to be past that because that only has a certain amount of shelf life. It gets, it's obsolete if you have partnerships between vendors related to proprietary data, it can have short-term benefits that are very useful. We need to get past that. And there are standards around the world and even in the U.S. that we need to look at. Um, down in the lower right, Crossrail represents London, England. The, the country of the U.K. has standardized on what they call uh, Pass 1192. It was sponsored by the British Standards Institute. We have NIST in the United States. I heard someone talk about the cost of interoperability. You know, NIST, national, uh, our national um, standard for technology estimates that it costs us $25 billion a year to deal with our data interoperability. So the return on investment is there. Some of the smartest people in our company I talked to about this, and they're telling me that it's a matter of um, a year or two before the artificial intelligence and uh, transformational applications can take care of this. I, I don't know, that, that may or may not happen, but I, but I think the subject of standards as part of a national infrastructure map could help sort of flush all that out, and it's something that could help us uh, bring the infrastructure map to reality. Uh, those of you in G GIS, you certainly know about the Open GIS Consortium. It started about 30 years ago, and uh, it's doing some great work. They have an RFI out right now that specifically relates to uh, interoperability, data sharing amongst, uh, amongst infrastructure. So there'll be a lot of good uh, input and results from that. Uh, Ashto has a similar RFP out on the streets related to helping uh, get a handle on data interoperability amongst all of our infrastructure assets. So there's a lot of good work going on in this area. I think the timing is absolutely right. And, and why not this group? You hear athletes say all the time, oh, you know, us versus them. Why, 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 we're just as smart, talented uh, as, as that other team. Why shouldn't it be us be the champion? So, so I would, maybe I'm giving them more credit than they deserve. <laughs> but with this group, I think uh, between AGS, National Academy of Construction, Public Administration, what a wonderful, diverse group who understands all of this as well as anybody from every different aspect. And uh, why, why, not, why not this partnership who could, uh, who could bring, bring this whole idea forward and it would make it would make one of the most significant contributions of the last uh, 
50 years related to our industry if you could be the leaders in uh, bringing that about. And I think our elected officials can and will be persuaded by a positive supporting arguments. I think you need both. I think you need the report card, which says here's, the, here's one side of this, and then I think you also need to win, we need to win the public over with the successful work that, that you and your colleagues are out there doing. We don't, we, we don't market ourselves as well as we should with all, of, uh, with all of the successes we're having. Not many of our staffs are growing, are they? So I think somebody said, if we're going to do more with less, uh, the technologies you're out there using has to be a critical part of that. And I think there's no question it is producing those kind of results. And we need to uh, do a better job of promoting that. I'll, I'll stop there. I had my alarm set and it was literally about to go off, so good timing. So I, I would be curious, how many, uh, how many people in the room uh, don't own a car? There you go, all right, let's give that man a round of, so, uh, so you know the popular thing to go to conferences and you hear about is Gen X, Gen Y, Gen Z, on and on, and everybody says, oh, the young people today, they don't, they don't want to own a car, you know, and I, and, and I, I would like to see us get to the point where you, where you don't feel like you need a car, you know, in order to get to your job and have the German model where you only use it on the weekend. But uh, I, I arrived here at seven o'clock this morning at the airport. I asked about the light rail. I'm, I'm a one-man survey. I go to these cities, and of course, we don't have this in Texas where you can arrive at the airport and, and not have to rent a car or Uber or whatever. But, you know, I walk down, get on the light rail system, walk right down here, and uh, since, the, since it's still cool, you know, so in 30 minutes, you know, I left the airport and I was here in 30 minutes and it, and it, and it cost me $2. Now, how amazing is that? Now, it's, it's nice that everything here is sort of new, but, but I relate it to Washington, D.C., where they had the circulator. I mean, I had never used the circulator before, so that's my test when I go to D.C. Uh, two times a year. Now I use the circulator to go to the other end of the city. But, but y what y'all have done here in, in Phoenix is, uh, I think, to be uh, emulated. Questions or comments? It is lunchtime, isn't it? So, so I hope you will, at your lunch table, talk about um, the role that three, three associations and, and, the, and the leadership of ASU certainly is not to be, uh, that, that's really important to have the academic sector as a, as a lead facilitator. I've, I've said many, many years, if we can get the public sector, the private sector, and education academic, if we can get all of them working together uh, with a plan, there's really not much we, we couldn't accomplish in this area. And, and I look forward to this uh, group being the, being the catalyst for that. Thanks. Thank you so much. We're going to go ahead and sign off or pause our broadcast to our friends in DC. Uh, and then we have lunch waiting for you. Thank you.